What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another Ask the Expert live Q&A with today's special guest, Sean King, which most of you probably know him as Mr. Fence. Sean, for about the two people out there that don't know you, why don't you give us a little bit about who you are and what you're up to? Yeah, so most people know me by Mr. Fence. Um, been in the fence industry most of my life, right? Like most of us here. So, Evansville, Indiana. Spent the uh, last, I don't know, 25, 30 years playing out the idea of trying to make a fence look proper and vertical, plumb to grade type of thing. So, a lot of guys know me as Mr. Fence, Mr. Fence Tools, um, and then recently Mr. Fence Academy uh, is one of the newest things we got cranking right now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so Sean, basically your passion is to A, build better fences and B, help other contractors build better fences. And help them build them faster. Maybe not, you know, there's some people out there build some really great fences, but can we make them, uh, can we help them become more efficient possibly? That's uh, in it. The process of the future, really, right? So uh, we don't have a secret sauce on how to build the most amazing fence. There's some really talented guys out there that could do that. I think our little niche is trying to figure out how to make the process repeatable and measurable for maybe someone with very little experience so they can have a successful business building fence. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and I'm glad you, so I'm glad you clarified it. A lot of guys get wrapped up in how fast they can build fence, right? And a lot of time it's, it's not a race, but it is important to be efficient. You know, like there, there is yin and yang there. Um, but I see, you know, there's a lot of guys that can build fast fence, but end up going back in, uh, you know, they, they've got a punch list at the end of the project. The key is efficiency. So I think efficiency is key. It's it's about, we're all in business to make money. Let's be honest. That's why we're doing this. I don't know if anyone's really in the fence business because they were bored and they find it to be a great hobby. At the end of the day, we're all trying to make money. So how do we do that? Well, we got to be able to buy material right, manage our manpower correct, use our resources properly build fence efficiently and quickly. Again, it's not a race. We don't be the fastest, but if we can routinely build it uh, quickly, then there's more opportunity for us to build more fence. If we yeah. take longer to build fence, higher cost and less opportunity. Well, you know, and that's the thing is, and when we're talking about, so a lot of guys want to talk about the price of fence, which for a lot of different reasons is not a great idea to do in a public forum. Right. But yeah. to get to the price of fence, you would take your material cost, your labor cost, your overhead, and your desired net profit. Like, those are going to be your keys. To bring that up because I had that conversation with somebody today. I was on one of the Facebook groups, actually. And I even mentioned to them, I bet that will probably come up today with Ask the Expert. Um, it's, it's already here. We're, we're two minutes into this conversation. <laughs> and we're talking about it already. It comes it up every week. It, it really is that simple. I break it down into those four categories. And, and generically, it's going to be materials and your labor, that's your cost of goods, that's above the line, overhead and net profits below the line. Um, so the way we control our price is by controlling our buying power, how efficient our crews are, as well as controlling our overhead. Those things will control your price. I like to tell people you really have no control over your price, you have control over your business, your business dictates your price. So right. I get people say, well, I'm gonna charge a little bit more than so-and-so down the street. I don't know. I don't know if you should be charging higher or lower than them. It really comes down to what is your overhead cost? What is your buying power? And how efficient are your crews? And then how much money do you want to make? I've, I've heard guys are happy with a few percent, and other guys are not happy with probably to multiple, you know, double digits. So it, you guys everybody's are goals are different. Yeah. It, it depends where your goals are at, is, is really the thing. You know, and you get so. You know, some of the discussion goes to, well, how can I lower, how, you know, so-and-so is, is a lot, you know, a lot less expensive than I am, which first, everybody knows their own value, right? As long as you know your value, you're right where you need to be. But the best way to lower your cost per foot is to become more efficient. So now all of a yeah. sudden you're building more fence. So if you add an extra job a week, you add more footage to the, to the week that you can divide your overhead across. That's right. It'll help carry right. the overhead, the net overhead cost. That's right. You know, the value thing there, Joe, is so true. If you get pushback from a client customer that says ABC fence company down the road says that they can build this fence for X cheaper than you, they're right. Like 
that's the value of their product. They're telling you the value. Of, they're the best judge of their value of their product than anybody. So they're only going to give you three thousand dollars. They're telling you it's worth three thousand dollars at best. It's worth three thousand dollars, and you might have a quote for four thousand. But the reality of it is, they're they're honestly telling you they're going to give you a product worth three thousand or less. They're not going to give you the four thousand dollar fence at a three thousand dollar price because they like it. That that's, that's right. not going to happen. That's right. right. And more often than not, what happens is they're stretching the ability to even give you a $3,000 fence. What I find happens more often is guys that are that low are actually charging more than what they should be charging for the end product and value they're actually giving to the consumer. So I like to break it down with them and talk about everything that's behind the scenes and what really makes up the cost. It's not just the boards you're looking at. There's liabilities and insurance possibilities. There's callbacks, longevity. Is the company going to be around for a while? What's the warranty going to be? Thank what you. can I not put in the ground? It's, I mean, I love it. They, they're telling you how much it's worth. You choose what you want to buy. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And that's usually what we what we try to talk about is, you know, here's the thing is, is in my business, we know the numbers down to the penny of where I need to be in this fence for me to walk away yeah. happy because we've got paid for it. And ultimately for you to be happy with the end result you've gotten and not have a, a group of callbacks because we try to get out of here as quickly as possible, you know, and not, I want this relationship to last and grow. That's important to me. So we're actually going to price, you know, an extra 20 minutes on site just outside of pure production time to make sure we're doing a final walkthrough to make sure mm -hmm. that everything is picked up, that we're, we ask when we're on site, is there anything else we can do for you while you're here? It doesn't really even need to be fence related. Move a plant, right. move some chairs, it, whatever it is, because to us, this relationship is important. And I believe that makes a difference, but I can't speak to other companies value. And I can't speak to that. They know their numbers as well as I do. Maybe they do. I don't know. I know I'm properly priced for the value I'm, I'm giving out. So that's the, the <laughs> thing about that is with everything else put aside, let's say uh, they are giving you a $3,000 value fence for four, you know, for a uh, competitive price on that four. The reality of it is guys that really know their numbers are more accurate on every single job they bid. And occasionally guys that are new to this that don't know their numbers are going to throw out a lower price that probably is way too low. Yeah. And for a consumer, they're like, well, that sounds good at 3000 bucks. But the reality of it is there was a, the guy doesn't know his numbers. More often than not, the guys that are low ball in price really don't know what it costs them to go fence, to be fair. Right? They yeah. haven't, haven't done enough research. So it's a mistake oftentimes when they price it at 3000 right? That's Less right. Than, and so what's going to happen is when they realize that mistake, they're going to do whatever they can to cut whatever corners they possibly can that the homeowner may or may not notice so they don't end up losing their butt on the job, right? Like that's absolutely. Natural. That's and that's, ask. you know, and guys, that's a dangerous part about asking about what other people charge for a six foot privacy fence, because yeah. that number could work for that individual, but it could be completely out of line for uh, your specific scenario. 100%. You know, it, yeah. Sean, Sean, if you and I were in the same market and had the same suppliers and, and everything was the same, we would still be at different prices. Absolutely. Right. We, Just we because there's... Yeah, we I mean, things differently and use different resources. Right, <laughs> right, and and we might also value the time differently, you know. And we might we're going to have different overheads because our staffs probably aren't going to be paid exactly the same and work the exact same hours. I mean, there's still right. going to be a fluctuation. So if you and I can't be the same exact price in one market, how in the world could we try to compare notes when we're you know thousands of miles away? Yeah. I, I think it's irresponsible to even try, you know, oftentimes you'll see that question come up on some of the social media sites. Hey, how much do you get this? How much do you charge for this type of fence per foot or whatever per day? And that's, that's really just a waste of energy. Like that conversation should never happen. Right. One, well, it's illegal. but two, it's just a waste of time. That's <laughs> it. That? You know, and, and I want to, I don't want to touch on that because you and I and, and a handful of other guys kind of, beat our heads against the wall trying to explain to guys it's not that we don't want to share this information on what we charge for fence one it's not applicable to you it's dangerous if you use it two it's absolutely illegal you know it in the sherman act for it's an antitrust issue to 
price collaboration is specifically mentioned in the Sherman Act in regards to antitrust litigation. So you and I talking about pricing is is a textbook textbook case of price collaboration. We're collaborating on our prices. And, and with social media now, you know, it's made it so much easier for somebody to do that or accidentally fall into that trap. That's right. Before, when that act came, you know, originally came out, it was more related to guys sitting in the back room at a meeting, maybe a convention or something. They're like, hey, guys, this is what we're going to charge across the board for this type of fence. If we all do that, we can build up more, you know, build sure. up our pocketbooks. Sure. And that's what they're trying to prevent. But now with social media, gosh, it's so easy just to send a message or blast it all on social media, hey, already charge in these private groups. And, and that's... Dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah. Bingo. Uh, it is. It, it's it's dangerous for you personally. It's also going to be dangerous for our industry. Yeah. I mean, um, we've all heard stories and, and rumors about guys that have got caught up with antitrust cases, which are it, this is not a misdemeanor type situation. Like these are federal <laughs> cases. No. Absolutely know. right. So I, I don't even want to skirt close to that possibility, you know, and, and that's why, you know, like I said, that's why you and I and a handful of others just kind of repeatedly over and over say, guys, this is, this is not the conversation to have. This conversation is not legal. And I understand, you know, the guys that say, well, I don't understand that. That doesn't apply to us. I mean, why should we be talking about, I can tell my price to whoever I want. Yeah. I, I'm not the guy you need to convince about this. I'm just right. the guy that knows the rules and doesn't want to break them and doesn't want to be associated with, you know, a group or in an industry that becomes known for that. I also wonder what the liability is for those of us on the private channel that aren't participating, but are involved because we either a help create the page or strongly yep. involved with the page. And if that happens, do we take any liability? I don't know. I really don't want to find I out the hard way. That's it. That's it. I don't know. And I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't even want to have to educate myself on, on whether or not, you know, there's, there's liabilities there. Um, but I mean, guys, that's a little bit of a tangent, but it's something that we see, I mean, probably almost daily between, between these different Facebook groups uh, that we're all, that we all kind of mingle in, um, is, it's not that no one wants to share that information. I mean, Sean and I are here today and, and there's other guys and, you know, Dan and Cannon are doing live shows as well, where what yep. we're trying to do is we're trying to open ourselves up and give as much value and education as we possibly can. As long as with, as long as it's within the, the letter of the law. But right? I think, Joe, that's really easy to do though. So we don't have to talk about price to give people some solid uh, experiences and knowledge by just, right having conversations about what is overhead. I, I know sure. guys ask me today, like, how do you track overhead? It's about gross margins. They're totally different from one company to another because what you put above the line or below the line is going to dramatically uh, impact what the gross margin is, the gross profit is. That's right. And so have a conversation and say, okay, what, you know, it's safe to say, like, do you put fuel above the line or below the line? And if you do, why or why not? Why are we costing it to direct cost of a job or why is it doing overhead? I, I've had conversations with like Mark Olson. He has a large uh, commercial fencing contractor and he oftentimes puts his direct fuel cost to the job because he's there for 30 days, fuel tanks there, like all the fuel is associated with that project. Yeah. But you a guy like me, that's almost, that's we're in and out of the project six to nine hours. Yeah. I don't know how much fuel was in that truck that day driving there and back. Like that's, it, it's impossible to track that I think, or unrealistic to track that. Yeah, so unrealistic. Blow line, right? Um, right, right. Well, because I mean, I I understand Mike. I understand Mark's point in that. I mean, if you didn't have that job, you wouldn't have that fuel expenditure. Yep. Right? I, I understand that. It is a, it is a cost associated with the job. But to your point, when we're running two or three, you know, if it's a if it's a job of full of small projects, two or three projects a day. Yeah. How do you allocate? Well, and to your point, how much fuel was in the truck when it started the day? How do you value that? And then how much of that fuel usage do you attribute to which project? It can get a little hairy. I understand so that. Like, yeah, it's like a law of diminishing returns. At what point does it become more time consuming to try to split hairs and track that than yeah. just understand the margin you're, you're quantifying? Like I'm saying my margin 
is X, it needs to be here, and that's based on the model that these two things are the line and everything else below the line. Like, yeah, that's so it. I'd be interesting to hear how you do fuel just as a so how we do it is our crew chiefs that are that are over production, so our installation crew chiefs. The fuel used on their fuel cards goes into cost of goods because I know that this this truck is only working on fence projects, and then the sales or consultant vehicles goes doesn't go in, towards the cost of goods, uh, only yeah, because so they're trying to generate it. So, uh, so if it's, I can absolutely see why you would. I don't do that. I see why you put in cost of goods because. That fuel you can quantify in a production truck was only used to produce fence, yeah. not to run deployments. Yeah. So I hundred percent, I can actually see that working out as a whole of putting it in above the line. Yeah. It's gonna change, you know, bring your overhead percentage down, increase your cost of goods, right? So <clears throat> yep. you should know what you're looking at. For us, yep. above the line cost of goods, we job cost every single job. So if there's anything that's a cost yep. of goods. It goes directly to a job. And my concern would be you're going to be having <clears throat> some leftover percentages that were not yeah. quantified to a job. They're unattributed. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. I could see that. And, and guys, this is a beautiful case, though, of there's always more than one, two, three ways you know, to perform a given task, to build a fence, to run a fence business. Um, I mean, obviously, both of our companies are successful, but we run them in a little bit different way. But it works for us, you know. It's you understand what you're looking at, what matrix you're reading, you know. So my gross margin, when I say, <clears throat> let's say it's, <clears throat> excuse me, just a fictitious number, fifty percent. If I were to say that it's fifty percent, my fifty might be different than your fifty because yeah. I have different things above and below the line. So th that's where it's dangerous when you talk to somebody and they say, "What's your gross margin?" You say fifty, and they're like, "Oh, well, I'm on forty. Well, what yeah. is the fifty made up? Like, what are we looking at?" It's the perspective of how you're quantifying and looking at that margin. Yeah, it's completely yeah. different for every company. Oh, it absolutely, and it, and that's and that's fine. Like it will be, comma, yeah. and that's okay. You know, so you and I both are kind of are in groups with uh, with Tom Reaver. Yeah. I like what he's up to. So he runs a yeah. contractor fight. He is passionate about bringing about bringing uh, respect back to the trades. That's kind of his tagline. And what he's pushing for is contractors to push themselves to achieve a 50% gross profit. Right. Now, a lot of people misunderstand him to say you can only make 50%. Like if right. you're not making 50, if you're making 49%, you're wrong. And the way I take it, the way I, you know, when I'm listening to him, whether it's his YouTube or his podcast, really all he's trying to do is say, guys, you need to get away from 30% or 33% and climb towards to 50% while bringing the commiserate value, right? So you need to find a way to bring value enough to achieve a fi an average 50% or thereabouts gross profit. So I think what he's with, with him trying to raise the, the professionalism of the industry is no different than we're trying to do in the in defense industry. I'm an advocate of, we need to raise professionalism so we're considered a professional industry like an HVAC, like a plumbers, like electricians, blueprints. We should have our own printed page for fence and not be hidden under landscape because we're a professional industry. But to, to Tom's point, it's really hard to operate a business like a professional business if you're not – if you don't have the operating expense that it would take to operate a professional business. So a guy in a truck working out of his house is going to have a little to no overhead. So he probably doesn't need a 50 or 60% margin, correct? Sure. That same guy, when he starts to run a professional business, has to recover the cost of business. And so if we start raising the cost of business, more professionals, and we don't educate everybody to raise their prices with it, they're all going to go broke. Does that make sense? So Yeah, I think, and I think, yeah, and I, and I think that's what – I think a, guy, a lot of guys get wrapped up in it's 50% or nothing. You know, I think companies that are larger companies that are doing, you know, multi-million a year in in top line revenue. That's not good. I 
Joe, you're still there, bud? We're having difficulties. Stand by. Let's check out some comments here. See what you guys say. Uh, Joe Everest is frozen. So is Mr. Finn still moving, guys? Joe is gone. Maybe take that time and respond to the comments. So let's just, uh, while Joe's getting back in here, Dylan Fence Prince is in the house. What's up, the Fence fam? Uh, guys, I've got my camera here, and I'm looking at the screen over here. I'm realizing we're going to have to make some adjustments because I'm off and I'm over here reading the TV screen and looking at Joe trying to get the camera. So maybe we take the TV and move it a little bit by help. Um, yeah, so I am not sure at all what happened there. We seem to have had a little blip here in the internet. I'm gonna try to uh, I'm gonna try to bring Sean back. Uh, You're live. We're here. We can see you, Joe. All right. So, why don't you guys let me know if you can if you can see us and hear us, Sean? Might be having some trouble with the internet. We're we're hardwired in here, but sometimes we get little blips. If you guys could drop you could drop a comment if you see us and hear us, that would be. Let's see if I can comment here. Uh, I can't comment. There's Joe's getting ready to call me. We can hear both of y'all. Fence King says. Okay, Fence King. Let me pull it up on YouTube and see. Just give see it. Each other's all good. Joe, you're good. Yeah, but you're uh, you're coming in kind of broken on my end. I'm afraid it might be your your internet, bud. Yeah, let me I see. Just had, uh, he's pulling up on YouTube. They said you're back. Looking good. We can hear you, Sean. Whoever it is. Uh, where can we get the cat? Where can we get the academy? Brand I'm gonna Parker. turn the volume down here real quick. So test, test, test. I can hear you just fine, my man. Let me call him real quick. Let Joe know he's good. Give old Joe a call. Hey, Sean. Hey, everything's coming through just fine. Yeah, and that's the, that's the thing is it's clear on my end, but it's showing your video as being choppy. The comments are saying that they can see both of us. Okay, okay. All right, no problem. All, right. All right, bye. Yeah. He said, who's hosting? Joe's hosting. This is his show. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to bring my volume up here so I can hear everybody. All right. So we seem to be back. Yep. I think we're good. <laughs> All right. Uh, ah, sorry about that, guys. So we we just had IT in here yesterday. Uh, we have a brand new super speed computer delivered today. Brand new internet service, direct wire. Uh I would hope we have some pretty solid internet speeds for here. Gosh, yeah, and, I mean, it, it very well could be on our end. I'm in a uh, I'm in a shared studio space, so we're still working on the office at uh, Ozark Fence HQ and our YouTube studio in there. So we're in a shared office space. It very well could be the internet here. Uh, we try to avoid this by not not using Wi-Fi by direct wiring in, but at the hey, end of the day, okay. you got what you got. Let's do this. I don't even know. This is probably be a good good time to check in with some folks, throw Let's some comments it. up. So Dylan's here. What is up, Fence Fam? Fence Prince checking in for the Fence King. I love it, Dylan. I'm gonna come back to your second comment here in a minute. So Dylan, so Fence King is here. Dan's here from Southeast Louisiana. I love it. And maybe we'll, looks like we lost Sean again. Um. Let's see here. All right. So then we've got, uh, so you, you could hear both of us. That's all good. All right. So then, so McQuid to answer, to answer your question, it's hosted on my end. So like I said, it very well could be, very well could be the internet over here. Uh, yeah, it, it probably is my internet. Like I'm not, not going to lie. It, uh, it, it could be, we haven't had problems before, but you never know in a shared office space it's always kind of it's always kind of hit or miss oh there he is good all right so sean let's do this let's uh 
I said hi to everybody as we were having you back on. And let's do this. Let's explain. Um, so you and I are getting together with a bunch of other fence guys and stain guys at the end of the month. What are we going to be up to? What are we up to? Uh, we're going to be – so we're going to be there entire week for the uh, first Mr. Fence Academy retreat. Um, that'll be for our retreat guys. You, can you plug in that camera? Just plug it. Oh, yeah, I was just I was just seeing that. I was like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> the camera is plugged in. Why would it not be charging? Very light flashing. Uh, yeah, ghosts. Uh, we sure we got um, juice on that outlet? Yeah, because the lights hooked up to it. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, so Plan B. If that happens, I'm gonna go to my cell phone and talk to you that way. We have Plan B if this thing goes dead. You bet. You probably, bet. That's probably gonna happen. Cool email. Cool email. Yeah, uh, let's preface this by saying we're fence guys, not tech yeah. guys. So <laughs> we're, we're fence guys yeah, trying to figure out tech stuff. I thought we were going to be so solid, but uh, when that game goes dead, I'm going to switch. No problem. <laughs> okay. We got a plan. Uh, yeah, so the uh, the fence academy retreat is for just the fence academy, academy members. We're probably going to have maybe seven or eight companies there at a, at a, at a house there locally. But on Friday, what's more important for me to hear is that we are going to be installing fence, uh, Mr. Fence ways, not anything other than just the way we do fence, not right, wrong, or indifferent. We're just going to share how we do it uh, with the tools, obviously, that we use. Oftentimes, we get asked, you know, um, what is the thumper, what is the protector, how these tools work. Yeah. So uh, we're just going to show how the process of how we build fence on Friday with our academy retreat members and then everyone else. Just, uh, Caleb's telling me like 130 people are insured or more. I be there. I would bet it'll be more. That's probably how many are signed up now. Last year's event, I want to say there's 100 or 150 people there at that event. And it was a one day event and it was just about staying. I would almost, I would almost bet we're gonna we're gonna have quite a few more people now that we've added yourself and on the fencing side. Uh, and there were a lot of people that after the Stan Seal event last year said, Oh, I couldn't come this year, but I'm going to come next year. So I would, I would say we're going to, I don't know, 200, 250, maybe something like that. Wow. Yeah. And hey, Jordan, can you take that camera right there and plug it into that PC, the USB? Uh-huh. I got, a, I got an idea. Okay. All right. We're we'll learning good. stuff today. Yep. We might have double, yeah, but if you plug it in, no, this one, Dorian, the big one. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And then yeah. just mount it up there. If it doesn't go dead for him. So, but uh, Joe, you're going to be with us at the Academy a little bit on one of the days, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to come in Wednesday, get checked in, and uh, head over. Actually, I'll probably see you guys because, so are you guys, the Academy itself for the week, you guys are in uh, Nashville itself? Yeah. So it's yeah. a little bit of a drive I saw from where we are in, to Lebanon. It's about a 30 minute drive. Uh, it's yeah. all interstate. So, uh, yeah, about, about a half hour from the airport. If I remember correctly, a little bit more from downtown Nashville, you know, kind of the, the strip area out to the interstate than over, but half hour plus or minus. Um, so probably what I'll end up doing is just flying in Wednesday and then coming and hanging out with you guys for a while, uh, talk well, marketing we, and we, all that. We, we, uh, you know, obviously, you're a coach as well with the uh, Mr. Fitz Academy. So we love to have that type of content. We offer that content to our academy members outside. It's not just me. Uh, there's multiple people in the academy that help uh, coach me. Well-versed uh, in, in what you do. And Dan Blanc, the Fence King, is in the group as well uh, as another coach. And then we've got my coach, actually, in the group as a coach. My son and my fiance, Heather, are all involved. So it's, it's way, way more than just Sean, there's a lot more to offer than just Sean. But, yeah, you're going to be there Thursday and uh, bring the Academy up to speed on how to have live videos with no interruption. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not get crazy here. Let's not get crazy. No, so yeah. I think I'm planning on talking to your Academy on Wednesday uh, because at Thursday I'm talking at the Stain and Steel University. Um, so okay. Stain and Steel is on Thursday and then fencing on Friday. Um, so I, I specifically asked Caleb if I could talk to everybody on Thursday because I'd really like to participate and just uh, be an active learner on the for the fence day. Uh, well, I am observer. Yeah, 
Yep. Yep. I, well, I'll be, I'll be a learner. I mean, I, I'm there to learn and, and to try to pick up tips and tricks. Uh, yeah. I'm also interested to, I'm all, also interested to see your tools. You know, we, we have a few that we use in our fence company that we bought from your website. If anyone else is interested in tools from your website, it's linked in the description below. Oh, cool. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to see them in action. You know, I've watched your videos, but there's, there's always something different about watching it in person and, and being able to raise your hand and say, well, wait a minute, how did you use that? Could you show me that one more time? Uh, I just, I'm always better at learning in person, yeah. you know, by touching and feeling. And, and so that's why we do the, part of the academy is also uh, installation training on site with our team. All right. Well, Sean knew this was coming. He's got a backup plan. Let's do this. Let's answer a few questions while we wait for him to uh, switch cameras real quick. I'm not sure. I'm going to, I'm going to bring this question up because I'm, I'm a little confused at it. So do you travel from Lordo? Not sure where Lordo is to Cali uh, as you were. And as you were traveling, why did you scare me with your creepy low tone voice? You could have made me pass out. Wow, man. I, uh, I don't. I last time I was in California is in February. Typically, I go out uh, every February for. Uh, I go to San Diego for um, social media marketing world. I blanked on that for a second, but I haven't uh, haven't been out of the state since last. I don't know, last March maybe. So we've been uh, locked up here in the great state of Missouri. And Jeremy, I'm going to save this question for when Sean comes back. I just want to let you know I saw it, so I do have thoughts on installing posts on a new retaining wall. Um, really? So a great question would be before we get going here on answering your question is the retaining wall. What's the, what is the retaining wall made of? Uh, it could be made of concrete or block, or it could be poured or, or uh, just stacked block. Why don't you let us know what it's made out of? And then, uh, we'll definitely try to get this answer for you. Alex says, Oh, Joe, I recently got a permit for a six foot wood fence. Finally. And the city says I have to dig four foot holes for the post. Is this unheard of or common so it's it's definitely gonna depend on your area uh so it's likely could be in one of the northern climates where the frost line is deep and uh and you need to go four foot to get below it um what part of the what part of the world are you in alec you, you, probably maybe northern united states maybe southern canada um yeah but to answer your question four foot deep holes for a six foot fence is not unheard of uh, in my neck of the woods, in kind of the Midwest, Southern Missouri, four foot's a bit excessive for a six foot tall fence. Um, but you, or yeah, four foot holes for a six foot six foot fence is excessive. Um, but when you were talking about, you know, our our uh, neighbors to the north, four foot is probably shallow for a six foot fence. Just when we're considering frost heave and all the goodness that comes with uh, the northern states. Oh, you answered the question, Ohio. So not not Ohio isn't as north. So, well, Sean, welcome back. Glad to have you. Maybe you can weigh in on this. So Alec, well, that's fence King. That's not Alec. Alec says that he recently got a permit for a six foot wood fence and the city says he has to dig four foot holes for posts. Is it unheard of or common? What do you think? Where, where is he out of? Did we He's out of about? Ohio. I, I think that is uh, for a six foot tall fence. ASTM standard is going to be 30 inches for that. Yep. Uh, I would believe four foot deep holes is a little overkill. I'm going to be surprised with why they would want that in Ohio. There's not a big frost heave issue. I wouldn't think. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of my thought. Well, first, before we learned that he lived in Ohio, I thought maybe he's in one of the far Northern States or maybe Southern right. Canada. I mean, four yeah. foot up there is shallow, you know, in, in some yeah. places. Um, but for Ohio, maybe a bit excessive. Um, so JJ, JJK weighed in on this. Uh, sounds like a city engineer lost their mind. Um, so <laughs> it, it very well could have to do with some sort of engineering aspect, but for a six foot privacy fence. And the reason I say that, so here in Springfield, if you want to build an eight foot tall fence, then you do have to have 36 inch holes. They have to be 18 inches wide and they have to be inspected by a city inspector before you pour concrete uh, because it's eight foot tall and, and it, they're viewing it more as a structure than a fence. Uh, but for, but for a six foot privacy fence, I agree with Sean. I think that's a bit overkill. So JJ weighs in again, says Ohio's frost line is 30. JJ's on the ball with this. Ohio's frost line is 30 inches. 
Majority of northeastern Ohio cities call for 36 inch deep, and and a few call for 42. So, yeah. there you go. He must but, be really northern Ohio. Northern yeah, Ohio. yeah, no, it could be. The thing is, the problem is, uh, once the city specs that, you don't really have a choice in the matter. You know, I mean, well, I, it, to, to play by the rules. I think it's a, it's a situation where he can help go educate the city. And the AFA, the American Fifth Association, can probably help him out and give him some data Correct. Uh, to take along with them because this may be a simple case of the city doesn't quite know what to do. No one's ever really provided them the resource uh, yeah. and the studies for what that finch, how it should be set. And maybe he should have that conversation and he should be the person to educate. Why not? Go talk to him and ask him why. Have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, knowing that, to your point, ASTM standards for a six-foot-tall privacy fence is 30-inch deep. Um, now, JJ says Ohio's frost line is 30 inches, so it makes sense that most Ohio cities call for 36 inch deep. I mean, six inches is typically sufficient to get under the frost line, knowing that typically the frost line is not achieved every year, yeah, you know, especially probably, lately. Yeah, it, it's probably highly unlikely they're ever going to see our actual 30 inch frost line. Um, right. Right. I, I like to just rule thumb to be safe, to really overkill. I like to see twice the twice the frost line. But I'm, when I say that, I'm talking about what your real frost line is, not this fictitious frozen time frost line. <laughs> right, right, right. Your actual yearly average frost yeah. line. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Alec kind of gives a little bit more insight in this is they have to do hole inspections as well. So it sounds like, to me, it sounds like they're, they're reviewing this as a structure rather than a fence. Um, you might want to clarify with them and just say, hey, just, just so we're all clear here, this is for a fence. This is a six foot tall fence. We're not building a structure here. Um, right. But I mean, here's the thing though. Some, some cities and municipalities can be excessive and there's not a great way around it. You know, Sean, to your point, education is always the best way. And so it'd probably start with, Hey, a ASTM standards are actually 30 inch, you know, also the frost line in our, in our area is 30 inch. So 36 inch would likely be sufficient to, you know, hold yeah. the fence up to keep it looking gray. It's not going to fall on anybody, um, that sort he, of thing. He would probably get further if he just asked why. Yeah. Right. Rather right. than you know, just, could somebody please just tell me why and his, use that information to start with. Yeah, uh, 100%. Yeah. All right. So let's scroll back up here. All right. Joe, the fence king, same, same hotel as you. You can ride with Dylan and I to Sean's in Nashville. So uh, I'll actually be... My plan is, so I'll be flying in Wednesday, and I'll just be hanging out with Sean and Sean's crew and talk about marketing stuff uh, there I, on Wednesday, and then probably drive on to the hotel that evening. I uh, would be my guess. I want to be. I want to. Here's the thing: is I get so excited for stuff like this. Like I know me, and like as soon as my feet hit the airport, you know, get off the plane, hit the airport, I'm gonna be like, Google it. How quickly can I get to this address? You know, and uh, I'm not gonna want to drive. To, to Lebanon and then drive back. I'm going to be all in on uh, on getting there and start to dive headfirst into it. I love it. All right. So, Makito asks, how would you use Postmaster Plus to install a 90-degree install a fence? For instance, fence that connects to my house and my neighbors, then the fence that divides our yards, two corner, po two corner posts. So, uh, it's not like three-way. Yeah. Three-way posts, I think. Yep, yep. How would you handle that, Sean, with a Postmaster Plus? And he's saying, do you just use two corner pieces? Yeah, so I would – let me preface this by saying Postmaster Plus Post, we only use the line post as a company. Sure. Um, they also have they also have corner post and gate post. Um, I, we don't use them as a, as a business. Just we learned with the Postmaster 1.0, if you will, the original Postmasters, um, when they didn't have corner posts. So in our process, we don't have – we just don't have a way of accounting for corners and gate posts. Um, so for a three way, I mean, that would be interesting. So probably two separate posts, wouldn't you think? So probably two separate posts, but the reality of it is this is, it brings up a good subject. Most people, especially if they're not in the fence industry, believe that the corner post is the strongest post and best set post. And, and I think all that comes from maybe uh, in, in like a world where you're pulling on a terminal post, like a chain link or a farm fence world, but in, yep. In the privacy wood fence world, the reality of it is you can attach those three sections together with no post 
and it would be rock solid because you're braced from all three sides. So you put it into one post, attach it to the section, and attach the other two sections to each other, and attach to the post. The reality of it is, and, you know, the corner posts on a wood fence um, are, and that's why he's building a wood fence, I imagine, are really, they're braced from two different directions. No different than the corner of the wall of the house. It yep. doesn't need to be set to the ground. You don't need any leverage for the cold depth. So you could get away with it, using that post and then running the rails past and connecting them together, then connecting them to the post. I mean, I think it's going to be the most solid post on the job site, cut off at grade level if you wanted to. Sure. Yeah, right. Right, right. Yeah, because all the, the posts further down the line are all kind of sharing the brunt of that pressure. It's braced from three different directions. So it can't go nowhere. Yeah, it's got no choice. Yeah, 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 your point. Your point's right. Even if the post isn't even set in the ground, you could just use a. We, we would call them a dummy post, just one that's you, not in there. You could literally not use a postmaster at all and connect all three sections together somehow with some vertical two by four, and it would yeah. be rock solid minus elevation. How would you keep it off the ground at the right height from settling? Minus yeah. that piece, but structurally side to side plumb would be solid. Yeah. So. So what the way I would handle it, so here's here's where my mind goes to is also kind of explaining all this to two customers. You got two neighbors sharing this is trying to explain that to a customer. I would probably end up using two posts only because then it cuts out a lot of questions and a lot of concern. And and honestly, I mean everyone pays different, you know, differently for the Postmaster Plus post, but I think retail they're twenty eight, twenty seven dollars, something like that. Um yeah. so I'll pay $27 not to have to really try to explain to each neighbor and their significant others. <laughs> and then, uh, and then all of their Facebook friends that they go ask about it. Uh, You're right. I'll, I'll pay the $27 and, and just roll right on past it. Yeah, you're right. But, yeah. but, but Sean's technically correct though. I mean, you could do no post or what we would call a dummy post that isn't set in the ground and it would be just as rock solid as That's if I use two posts. Minus the fact it would settle, maybe he. There's that issue. On that right. Side. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. So Sean, now that we got you, we've got a question. I'm going to scroll back up to. I'd like to hear you weigh in on it. Where has it gone? Okay. So Jeremy wanted to know, hey, any thoughts on or videos on installing post into a new retaining wall? I had asked what the retaining wall was made out of, and Jeremy let us know that it is solid concrete pour. I would bolt them. Bingo. Yep, absolutely. So you could do it with a Postmaster Plus post. You can cut it to height and then weld a, yep. depending on how big the wall is, typically we would use a six by six quarter inch uh, steel post. You could also use a four by four if the wall isn't that thick. Yeah, and then just drill and tap them, tap con concrete anchors. Yeah. I do know there's some guys, and I've done it before, you core drill a wall, three or four inch core, you can actually break that core out. Uh, yeah. You don't have to go through the wall. You get in there six inches or so, you could actually break that core with enough leverage, not how wide the hole is, but how deep you got to go to break it. You break that out and then uh, hydraulic cement and uh, a post. But here's my argument against that is – I've seen concrete get blown out. If you don't have the hydraulic cement, there's any void where water can get in there at yep. all between the post, the hydraulic, or the hydraulic and the concrete, it'll freeze and expand and blow out the wall. I've seen this happen multiple times. So it's just a matter of if there's an air pocket for water to get in there, it'll freeze and blow it out. The other thing to consider when you core through a wall and put a post in hydraulic cement is damage. If it does get damaged or bent, uh, by somebody, it's difficult to replace it without causing significant damage to the wall or moving the post. If you bolt it, it's really easy to unbolt, put a new one down. Yep. Now, and that's, that's absolutely right. Is I've seen too many, especially if it's a new concrete wall, I've seen too many concrete walls get blown out core drilling because yeah. sometimes like on a commercial project, sometimes it's just specified that way and you can submit an alternate, an alternate for plated and tap cons. You can put, you give them all the engineered drawings you want, and they're not having it. It's going to be so, core drilled or nothing. Let me share. Let me share a story real quick of a lesson I learned the hard way in this situation many, many years ago. I had an aluminum fence on a block wall. Okay, so it was core okay. filled back block wall. This wall was probably 15 foot tall off of a lake. 
All right. Okay. I took the effort to core drill it, sink the post down. Uh, let's say it might have been a foot or so. Hydraulic cement, put the post in there. Um, the failure of the of the wall or the failure of the fence happened when water got in the aluminum post through the holes where the rail is, filled up the hole in the post through the inside of the post. Because it had no insulation, it froze uh -huh. and blew out the entire face of the wall all the way down this thing. So water penetrated the aluminum post, which is really to do with aluminum rail going through it. Yep. It filled the cavity of the few inches I had inside the wall, which only three or four inches from the face of the wall. That water froze and literally blew out all of those blocks. Yeah. So I will no longer core and mount to a block to a retaining wall that's made that way. The fence has to go inside, which is a good you know. Now you got to worry about geo grid and drainage tile digging those holes. Yeah. Uh, we'll dry a post and try to get the work with the contractor to make sure we can get the the textile back and the uh, drain top so we don't puncture it. But, but I learned it the hard way, guys. It cost me an obscene amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. It's there, there's just too much risk there, core drilling. Yeah. You know, especially when, you know, the, the risk of, of surface mounting with the, either a wedge anchor. We prefer tap cons, but you can also do it with like a wedge anchor. Um, the downside or the risk there is really minimal. You know, I mean, it, you're drilling a little bit closer to the edge of the wall. I guess you could you could think exactly. of it that way, but you're drilling a smaller hole. So we have great success with uh, they're not wedge bolts; they're just they're removable anchors that have threads, like a tap con. Yeah. On go rights, right? Half inch, five eighths. Yeah, that's what eighths. we use. Those work fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> but I but the same thing on a block wall with a cap. If you bolt to the cap, the cap may or may not be glued down, and even if it yeah. is glued down. It's probably not going to hold up to somebody bumping into it. Now we, we it would take an, an incredible amount of convincing for us to attach to a wall. We yeah. almost always step inside and, and build it, and yeah. and sometimes guys, you have to recognize that you might not be the ideal contractor for that project. You know, just sure. because you got to weigh the risk reward here. I mean, life is all about risk and reward, and. The risk is, yeah, to your point, the cap's not glued, or even if the cap is glued, that there's nothing to say that the adhesive was applied correctly, that the adhesive itself, even if it was applied correctly, you know, fails just to manufacture defect. But guess who gets the first phone call? And guess who all the burden goes to on doing all the detective work on why this thing failed? It's going to go to the fence guy. Guaranteed. So. Sure. Uh, so here is, so Jeremy follows this up by asking, is it a bad idea to set the post while I pour the concrete wall? I would probably prefer that. Yeah, that would work well. Uh, it, the only disadvantage goes back to if there's ever a damage to the post. Right. To be significantly different, or harder to replace, repair, or patch. Uh, if a car runs, I don't know the steps scenario, right? If a car runs into it, someone backs over it, I don't know, and tears it up. Yeah. Then it's very difficult to core again. Where the well, post is. yeah, you can't core again. Well, I mean, I don't say can't, you can, but, uh, what, so here in the Midwest setting post, it were, was a huge deal with, with, uh, pools. They were set at the same time as the pool pad. So they're set in place. So what we've ended up doing, and a lot of those are rusting out now is so we'll cut those flush and then plate mount above it. Above it. Yeah. And yep. that way you cover up the posts, you you know, so there's not that eyesore, but now you're replacing it in a way that should this happen again, it can be repaired a little bit easier. It's more expensive this way, but it's less expensive in the long run. Yeah, makes sense. But yeah, I, I would, you know, if you've got the time and inclination, pour it in the wall. It'll be a strong post until, you know, until the day it needs replaced. Right. All right. Let me scroll through here. All right, so I'll throw this up here just to say it's here, and then we'll move on. Uh, Nathan Britt asked if we could buy him a birthday cake because I'm really in the mood for desserts. So I really want to eat a big fat cake so bad that I never want to share. I cool. appreciate you sharing that with us. Thanks, Nathan. Yep, I, I can't buy you a cake, though. I apologize. Um, let's see. So 
<laughs> this is a good one. I, uh, yeah. Hey, Sean, do you ever get that homeowner customer hanging over your shoulder, trying to be a part of the crew or asking hundreds of questions during an install? Has that ever happened? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Gosh, you do uh, to get him away. Let me do my job. Woo. Yeah, and there's uh, not there's not a great way of addressing it. It's a fine line you walk between being rude and professional. So you got to get to work. Yeah, I mean, you see guys online that say, you know what I say? I tell the customer I have one rate for if I build the fence, and I have an, another rate if you help me build the fence, and it's twice as much. <laughs> Well, I'm not saying that to my customer. <laughs> well, we had we had this happen just this week. We had a job that the crew was doing a fantastic job on, and then they weren't quite as far as long as I suspected based on the performance earlier today. They said, well, the homer's been out here for a couple of hours. There's nothing wrong, but we have to explain and walk them through everything we've done so far, and it has taken us just time. Now, yeah. to be fair, this homer is paying – Eleven thousand dollars for a fence. So first yeah. time they bought a fence. This yeah. is a big purchase to them. They want to know everything yeah. about the process and how we're together. They've hired us as a professional. So to be fair, my foreman did what he should have done. He took the time, talked to the consumer, made sure they were happy, answered their questions, even if they were redundant, and even though they were slowing us down. And yeah, you know, that's who we are. That's how we set. That's part of that overhead we talked about. The unaccountable piece of being in business and being that company, bingo. we paid for that inefficiency of the crew to make sure the customer was ultimately happy. And now we'll probably, he'll probably recommend us, right? For no right. other reason, we took the time to talk to him. So, well, and, that, and that's the thing is, is you run a fine line, like you said, between, you know, just the customer being happy and really just taking them off to say, you know what, these fence guys, all I tried to do was ask them a few questions and they told me to stay out of their way, you know, stay on the porch and not get in their way. Uh, you better believe that negative reviews and negative feedback travel further faster. Speaking of that, this is a great time. We're going to bring this up. I'm so frustrated yesterday. We got a negative review, one star. And I, it just boils my blood. So I immediately started going to investigation mode. Like, how is this possible? And this review said, uh, you guys were unprofessional. You missed your appointment with me. And so I'm instantly engaged with my team. This is after hours in the evening. I'm like, I'm trying to call, like, how do we miss an appointment? One, with all the redundancies and all the checks and balances we have in our company, I'm like, really seems practically impossible. Well, I uh, have GPS in the trucks, including the sales vans. So I pulled up his, I confirmed where he was, his appointment time, the GPS on the truck. Uh, and it showed in front of his house. Uh, 15, 17 minutes prior to the start of the estimate, it was in front of the house. Yep. And it showed that my sales van was there for seven minutes past the start of the estimate. And I contacted uh, and found out my sales team called him twice from in front of the house and left the voicemail and then had the office call from the office line and left the voicemail. The guy was a no-show. What happened hmm. was, I suspect he still hasn't returned my call. I've called him multiple times. I think he mixed up the dates, had the wrong yeah. date and time. It no happens. Date. Okay. But how do you go and put a one-star review on a company that's it's doing, I mean, we're very professional, well-recognized, five-star reviews, and we got this one-star review for lack of communication is what it comes down to. And, and we did everything we could. Sure. So, so this is, I'd like to talk about this for a second, ha handling negative reviews. How did you hand, how did you respond to the review? You know what? I'm going to, this is good. You brought this up. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share it because I was originally upset about it. And then I thought, you know what? I should just use this opportunity to educate um, everyone around us. So here it is. Marie to you, uh, scheduled an appointment for Espen and never showed up. That was his comment. This is how I replied. We appreciate your feedback. And I have looked into this. I have confirmed that my team did have you confirmed for an estimate at your house. We showed that your scheduled estimate time was 11 a.m. Our team member arrived at your house at 1043. He was not able to contact you with anyone or anyone else in the residence, and we tried to call and left a message. He then had our office call and tried to contact you from our landline, 
thinking maybe you didn't recognize his cell number. Our team member continued to wait for 24 minutes until 11.07. We apologize for the possible miscommunication. I am very proud to say our team does an outstanding job with fulfilling our commitments, keeping our team organized and on time. Mr. Fence is a Blue Ribbon accredited fence company from the American Fence Association and one of the only ones, in, the only one in Tri-State. This has given us a very select few companies in the United States and seal approval. I would challenge you and suggest that the one star review is not accurately representing our company. And here's my cell number. I think that's a great response, Sean. <laughs> I, I do. Here, here's what, here's how I usually put it is when you're responding to a negative review, you're not replying to that person. You're right. replying to everyone that will read that in the future. Yep. So what you did was you did a great job explaining what your process was. So that if I'm, if I, if I know nothing about Mr. If I just moved to your town and I have no idea who Mr. Fence is and I'm reading reviews first, when I see a one-star review that says you didn't show up, I'm like, uh Oh, but then I read the response. I go, Oh, wait a minute. So not only did they show up, they showed up early. They called a couple times, the office called, and it was probably just a mistaken. It was a mis mistaken date and time. Uh, but you responding that way shows that one and you leaving your cell phone number shows that you personally are vested in the reputation of your company and that you stand behind your team and, and you know, the processes and procedure you have in place. So Joe, I would suggest that even as much as they frustrate me, that even one star reviews are, can be just as effective as educating your customers on who you are as a five star review. Okay. So listen yep. to what I'm trying to say in our business, we make mistakes all the time. And sure. in our business, we have a process at Mr. Fence for those mistakes, pink sheets, blue sheets. So I'm proud to tell consumers when I talk to them, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But I am proud to tell you that we have a process and a procedure to handle those mistakes. Right. And I talk about that. There's no different than my review. This guy obviously was upset. We missed his appointment for what he thought his appointment time was. But I think I was able to prove to my clients that we are professional because I didn't get on there and tell him he's a liar and Right. You. I didn't do that. I yeah. just stayed with what we knew and had and opened it up for our communication. So what does that tell your next consumer? These yep. guys are probably somebody I want to work with because if there is a problem, this is probably how he's going to react. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing is, and, and the, the owner jumped all over this to make sure it was made right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's huge, you know, because, you know, we see this in the groups a lot. Hey, you know, this is a horrible review I got. And here's what I told him. I told him this, this, and this like, well, here's the thing. It probably didn't make you feel better after you said it. Didn't make them feel better after you said it. And now everyone that comes along is going to read that. Yep. So you, you have to, you have to judge it from, you know, the perspective of someone that knows nothing about your business, who is, you know, interviewing you virtually for this project and the interview process starts before they even pick up the phone or use the online quote tool the interview you process want know, you want to know the good bad and the ugly for interviewing somebody right right like well and a problem like this you should always start with that conversation right so here's how i here's how i buy stuff on amazon is i'll search it and i go straight to the reviews i own you know four stars and above all right now, if I see one that is only five stars, that makes me a little curious. Like that seems fishy because I know in this wild world of ours, you can't make everybody happy. There's going to be some mistakes. And sure. so, and so, I'll, so if it's all five stars, it's automatically out. Cause that's probably a scam. And then two, you know, if it's four and a half stars, I go straight to the negatives. Tell me what's wrong with this. But the other thing to consider is how many reviews. Right, right. Yeah. If you got two reviews and someone else has two, like damn, Wong, he's got reviews like crazy, two hundred reviews, and they're five and they're five stars. He's got a ton of reviews. That's a yep. lot different. The defense company has two reviews; they're both five stars. That doesn't mean as much to me. No, no, it doesn't. You know, and that's Dan does a great job of trying to trying to educate everyone on how important reviews are to have on your Google and your Facebook. Because here's the here's the thing, too, guys. So say you get a one star review. We've got one-star reviews on our on our Google account. We had one the other day. When I looked it up, it was the wife of someone that worked at one of our competitors. Uh, There's a pretty good chance we didn't build her fence. Uh, <laughs> but so 
okay, so you can respond to this in one of two ways. You can call you can call it what it is. Hey, I looked you up, and it turns out that you work for. That's not a good look. So we responded. I responded back with, you know, hey, Jane Doe, I looked through our customer records that go back roughly 25 years, and I couldn't find your name in there. It's possible that the project was installed under a different name. I'd be more than happy to look it up. Five star experiences are important to us. I well, no, I say five star reviews are critical to us, and they're you know incredibly important. I wanted to learn how we how you know how we fell short of a five star review. Please reach out to me directly, and I put my email address. I didn't put my cell phone. So um, did you say it was her boyfriend or fiance or husband works her, her hu Yeah, I believe her husband worked at a competitor. Yeah, I think I would have said at the end of that. I would have said, and by the way, your husband does fantastic work at the at the <laughs> Like, give them props. Like, hey, you know, uh, yeah. your husband, and, uh, I, I've watched him. I mean, you're better off oftentimes giving a compliment. But yet, at yeah. the same time, she's like, oh, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. And more importantly, everyone else that comes in and sees that, now they go, oh, okay, I know what that is. But, but, you, but you gave him a compliment. Like, hey, I mean, he's done fantastic work for years. So I said hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Reviews are important. And where I'm going with this is so we have a one star review and you can't take them off and you don't want to take them off because again, they lead to legitimacy that if you, if you only ever had five stars, that would look suspicious. But if you had, so, you know, in, in Dan's case, if I had 200 five star reviews and I had five one star reviews, I'm going to come out at 4.9. Right. Wow. And, and so I'm still going to come out looking great. You bury the one star reviews with five star reviews and then you yeah. move on. Hundred percent. All right, I'm gonna go back into this. So Jeremy, he had the question about the post in the wall. I really appreciate you guys. The reason I was wanting to put it in the wall, the post in the wall, uh, while pouring, is because it'll be an eight foot tall horizontal fence that's so eight foot on top of the two foot retaining wall. Um, probably a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I would bolt that on top of the wall. No, no, no. It, now, <laughs> now, now that we learn more about yeah. what this is. Now, however, if we did have that conversation with both on the wall, I would do it on four foot centers. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So traditionally, eight foot centers. So if you tell me, Sean, I got an eight foot tall fence, and I, I'm considering putting it on top of a 12 inch thick poured wall, um, and I hear what you're saying about it's better longevity to have a bolted rather than core drilled in. Sure. Or set in. If you go to four foot centers, you're going to dramatically, tremendously increase the strength. Uh, that with half inch eye bolts. I mean, it's still possible bolts on the wall. We just got no more details. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. And you, you need to understand, you know, how much structural load there's going to be on those posts. You know, you're not what I, my mind always goes to in the middle of winter when it's got a sheet of ice on it and the wind is howling. How is this thing going to perform? Because if it can worst perform case, in that, then it's good. What's the worst case scenario? Yes. Bingo. Uh, yeah. So Jeremy, we appreciate your comments. Uh oh, I think you know this guy, Chris Steele. That's a cool blue chrome fin sign above Sean. Look at that. That's Chris. That's a good looking well, sign if I've ever seen one. Sure you were in there, Chris. <laughs> now, and you and uh, to give you guys to give your channel props, uh, Sean. You actually interviewed Chris. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, our first interview didn't go fantastic. <laughs> it's content. Uh, it's it's content. Content. It was there. Yeah. For I sure. loved it. Chris was just here last week and sat here at the bar. We had, uh, he was nervous as all get out. Let me tell you what. We were, oh my gosh. We went live here from the bar, had a little cold beverage, getting lubed up there for a little bit. <laughs> he was panicking. Yeah. Um, but no, it was fun. We talked and then uh, I think we had a problem. IT with internet or battery went dead. We're still trying to figure all this out. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely a learning process. It really is. But no, I thought you guys did great. I thought Chris did great because you could tell he was nervous. You, know, you could tell because it's not. Listen, guys, here's the thing. It's like sitting here and talking to a camera is not the most natural thing in the world. Right. <laughs> it's not It's not something you just wake up going, you know what I really want to do today? I want to talk to a wall for a while. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's not natural. But yeah. I get, I give I give Chris props for, for sitting down and doing it and, uh, and doing a good job at it. So, yeah. I think you guys did great. So Fence King was weighing in on the customer over the shoulder. So my guys take a break. The homeowner calls says they'll take a lot of breaks. We've gotten that call before. I replied with, are you looking over the shoulder? And I said, yeah. And I, and I say, well, that's why. 
Okay. All right, Dan. I hope that's not what you said, but we all we all understand. We get it. Uh, we do get the calls though, and, and it's funny. Uh, not funny, I guess. But the hey, your guys, you know, they're taking breaks instead of building my fence. Oh, well, good news! I got that priced into it, <laughs> and right. and because you know we have so we have temperature restrictions, right? So if it's above ninety degrees, and you know uh, heat index, then they take one break every typically every forty five minutes. Just because, and a break can be five minutes under a shade tree grabbing a drink of water. Yeah. I do not want them dehydrated. I don't want heat exhaustion. I'm looking, I'm looking out for my guys because they're they're one of my most valuable assets. You know, I would say they are your most valuable asset. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would to say they are the number one asset, and oftentimes uh, we overlook that. And yep. Uh, yep. So we we definitely have changed our culture here, thinking that we need, we need to help them with eating properly, taking the breaks, getting plenty of rest, not overworking uh, them. Because oftentimes you look at guys and they'll work six days a week, 10, 12 hour days, eat like crap from a gas station. Uh, and what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. They're going to they're perform uh, subpar. It's no different than driving a car and putting crap fuel in it, running at 110 miles an hour and driving every single day, pedal to metal. It's probably going to break down. Probably going to be in bad shape. Going sick, while they're tired, demotivated, probably not real happy about their job. Sure. You can take the same person uh, and help them uh, become healthier by eating better. Like we provide meals for our, our team members, breakfast and lunch, so they're healthy meals. Because that's sometimes probably the best healthy meal they're going to eat all day. Yep. Uh, yep. Rather than a lot of the gas station, we save money from running the, gas, the truck to the gas station and whatnot. Yeah. But slow it down and become more efficient. So let's use tools, methods, and procedures so that you're able to build a fence just as fast with the brakes and not have to work six days a week, 12 hours a day. How about four days a week, 10 hours a day, the same amount of work? Absolutely. Well, and, and that's the thing is that's part of the conversation, too, with the customer is that, you know, and, and finding a polite way to bring it into the conversation, but say, you, you're paying me for the end result. You and I came to an agreement that I'm going to provide a hundred foot of six foot privacy fence at a five star level to get there. This is our process and, it, and it's what works for us. Uh, well, I tell you what we have coming up and it sounds like, so next week is like the first time. And I don't know how many years that every state in the United States is going to be below their average temperature, oh my big cold wave coming through the United States. So here in, here in Missouri, it's like highs of 27 low of like seven for four or five days straight. So we're going to have a long conversation about cold weather safety. Yep. You know, yep. one thing we do with cold weather safety is we leave a truck running. We do same. Yep. Now it's, is it an efficient use of fuel? It's not, but it's a warm space that they can retreat when, if they feel fingers tingle or if they feel nose tingle, I mean, all, if they start seeing and feeling the effects of cold weather damage to their body. Uh, and so they have a, they have a warm place to retreat to. For sure. Yep. And if, and if the customer would like to talk to me about that, I'd be happy to explain it, which I mean, <laughs> it, it's all on how you handle it though. Right. It, it, it really is. All right. So Jackson fence is with, is with us. What is up Jackson fence? How are you guys? Cannon? Is that Cannon? Probably. I think so. All right. Let's see. Fishing and Picking says, I look at negative reviews and owner's feedback as a great thing because sometimes companies with five stars look a little fishy at like buying reviews. I went to a dentist with five stars. It was terrible. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, if a place with all five stars is is a little fishy. Could be. Uh, yeah. I, I like that his avatar is a fish and he used the word fishy. 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 As a dad, I acknowledge that and I appreciate it. Nice. Nicholas says, I have 10 years experience. I have no idea how to estimate for jobs, mainly just labor. What do you propose? So. Uh, 10 Nick years experience of what? I guess building fence probably, right? Probably. I mean, it's that's. Just out of that to maybe run his own company. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I would. I mean, that's common, right? Yeah. That, that guys work for, you know, eight, 10, 12 years in a company and then decide to go out on their own. It happens. It's, it's natural. Yeah. Um, so Nicholas, there's, 
It's a big, this is a big conversation. So this goes back to what we started. So Nicholas, I don't know if you just joined us, but when we first started this video, we talked about uh, quantifying your costs in your business is directly going to be related to what you should charge your customers. So your direct costs, your materials and your labor, your costs, your overhead cost, and how much money you want to make. You need to figure out what those numbers are. And that will tell you what price you should be charging on how to estimate jobs. He's asking, how do I estimate jobs? You yep. need to find out what percentage of markup or, or the margin you're trying to create and work backwards from there, your known cost, and then use those multipliers uh, that you learn from your instruction. If you're brand new and you've never done any of this, uh, take one job at a time, take your total cost for that job, consider everything outside those costs like operating costs, your vehicles, your insurance, liabilities, fuel, lights, everything. Yep. And put that to a put that to a number and make sure you're recovering all those costs. I think more often than not, Joe, people do not cover enough costs outside of the materials themselves. Agreed. Uh, and slowly but surely as they start their business, they just get like a blow constrictor just keeps constricting them and they're becoming less and less cash flow. And more and more broke, even though That's they right. say a hundred half million dollars of work. Where's all the money? Well, you didn't charge enough, so half a million should have been seven hundred fifty thousand, possibly. Yeah. Right. And there's right. where your money is. Yeah. So, as, as a general, as a general guideline rule of thumb, as as a place to start, and understand that your numbers need to be your numbers, but you got to figure out what all the materials are going to cost. So, whether you're bidding that from a wholesaler, retailer, what have you, all the all the materials, you're going to need to figure out what your labor cost is. Now, if it's, if it's you installing a fence by yourself, you still need to value your time correctly. You know, if it, what are you paying you? Right. And so what is your labor cost and include, here's the thing that trips guys up to when I say labor cost, I mean, total labor cost. So that includes labor burden. So you're yeah. going to have payroll tax. You're going to have, you're going to have ancillary cost to your labor. So your total labor cost. All your costs associated with this job, if you double that, that should put you at a 50% gross profit. Yeah, close. Right. And so that's a starting point. I don't want to say that's your end bid, but that's your starting point to know, are you even in the right ballpark? I, but, I would agree with that. I would suggest steer clear of trying to chase anybody else's price, period, around you whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else's price has nothing to do with you or your business. And that's kind of what we chatted about in the beginning is if Sean's company and my company were in the same city, bought from the same suppliers, hired similar guys and gals, our prices would still be different. Yeah. Just We run our businesses differently. We have different process, et cetera. Um, you, uh, everyone else in your market, their price for fence has absolutely nothing to do with your price of fence. You need to establish your price. Sure. Uh, so one thing too here I'll add, Sean, that might be interesting to talk about is, um, so we charge for equipment rental, yeah. meaning that if we're going to have, you know, a, a mini skid, a, a dingo or, you know, MT-80 or whatever like that, what it would cost to rent that and put it on the site. Uh, you know, all, now we're not charging for hand tools and, and stuff like that, but the bigger equipment we absolutely charge for. The reason... Michael just the, the difference perspective, right? So we come, we recover that same charge, but for ours, it's disguised and wrapped up into the overhead cost. For you, yeah. you pull it out the overhead, put it in the direct cost and associate it to the project, which is even more accurate than what we're doing. Uh, but in a day, we both can agree it needs to be recovered and accounted for right. somehow. Well, it, and, the, and the reason I view this as being important is because should a machine go down, we can go rent one and bring it onto the site and not be upside down on the project. Right. You know, a lot of guys are talking, you know, a lot of guys talk about, well, I don't charge for equipment because I own my equipment because I don't have to go rent it because fine. Like I get it. We don't have to go rent equipment either, but if you're not charging for your equipment and that piece of equipment goes down, which equipment goes down all the time, brand new equipment still needs service. Uh, you're in a bad position, right? It's, you, now it's, it's coming possible. out of your pocket. You need to recover the cost of the equipment, right? And yeah. replacement cost as well. Like it's a tool. Well, that's so that's the cover. thing is part of our equipment cost is our truck and our trailer. Yeah. I mean, those are depreciating assets. I mean, there's yeah. there's going to come a day where I've got to buy a new one or lease a new one or what have you. 
you need to recover the depreciation at least. Agreed. Right. Absolutely. All right. Jackson Fence has a question. Cannon likely says, going to put up a going to put a twenty foot farm gate in, no fence attached. What's your suggestion for gate post? Is that a double gate cannon or a single? Big difference. A twenty foot single gate is totally different than a twenty foot double drive gate. Well, let's, let's, Sean, let's do this. Let's answer it both ways. Okay. If it was a 20-foot single gate, I would strongly urge you to look at this, uh, a cantilever gate or a steel frame gate. I would be concerned of any sort of a farm gate would 20-foot. Oh. oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? So when he says farm fence, I'm thinking some I, sort of wood with wire on it or, kinda, or big rail wood. Well, I, so my mind, and this is good to clarify, Cannon, is my mind goes to a uh, uh, – Round frame, what we'd call a D gate. And yep, we call those a cattle gate. Okay. So it could be a cattle gate, 20 foot. What size post would you need for that? Uh, I think what's probably more important is the size of footing. The, the size of the post is key, don't get me wrong. Yep. But we should also have a conversation with the size of footing. It's going to be almost just as important as this deflection of the post itself because the footer going to pull over. Uh, 20 foot cattle gate, those things don't weigh next to nothing. I would I would say you can probably squeeze by with a six by six set four and a half foot in the ground. Yep. If you have one to put a larger post, I mean six by six would be the minimum size post. Now, if it's in a corner post, a brace two different directions. I know you're gonna be great. Uh, if it's a six by six brace in a line of fence, it's not gonna pull that post over for sag because the entire fence line is supported. Yep. It just depends on is it gonna be open at ninety degrees or is it gonna be open at one hundred and eighty. And if the gate's gonna be open at one hundred and eighty, then you really don't have to oversize the post because it's either gonna be Close, which is supporting from the fence line, or all the way open, which again is supporting from the fence line. If that makes sense. If the gate's in line with the fence. Yep. And I'll, I'll answer this from my perspective. So we don't we don't typically install wood posts anymore, only because we've had we've had some bad experience with wood posts in general. So my mind would go more towards a steel post. So I, I agree with you on footing. Four four and a half foot would be minimum, and and probably eighteen to twenty inch wide yeah. hole. Uh, we would probably go if it's a single gate, probably do a four inch schedule forty. Um, if I was steel, I would agree four inch for sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I think four inch schedule forty because you can get hinges relatively easily, whether they're. And it depends how how long or how far they want them open. If it's a hundred degree, hundred eighty degree, or uh, what have you. But yeah, I think four inch. If it's a double gate, maybe we'd probably do three inch. Well, all right, thank you. Cannon Jackson Fence. Chris says he doesn't think you did a good job at your interview, but thank you both. The next one will be better. That's the thing. <laughs> Everybody starts somewhere. I think you yeah. did a great job. I do yeah. I do quite a bit of video and I think you did great. Yeah. You know, can you tell you were nervous? Sure. But hey, here's the thing. You did better than 90% of guys out there because you did it. <laughs> so what do you like to say? I love your saying. Done is better than done perfect. Yep. Yep. Done is better than perfect. That's right. Yep. Uh, I, here's the thing is I had so much head trash around editing and around shooting and, and stopping all the time to edit out the ums and the ahs. And we still do that to some extent, but I was at a, I was at a conference's vid summit. I talked about YouTube comment and someone said, one of the speakers said that, and it was just like a resonating moment. They're like, done is better than perfect. You yeah. could spend all day making it perfect, or you can spend an hour getting it done. Which would you prefer? So the fact that you did it, Chris, puts you head and heels above a lot of other guys. What's up, Kenny Dugan? Just got gas, heading back on the road and listening to you knuckleheads. <laughs> Kenny, who are you calling a knucklehead, you knucklehead? Uh, we are fence guys. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> What is up, Kenny? Kenny is going to be at on the standing portion of the Staining Steel University and Fence Installation School coming up at the end of the month. Uh, Sean, do you know Kenny? Have you met Kenny? I don't think I have. I think you guys get along really well. He's This guy knows the ins and outs and tips and tricks of staying in the fence, and uh, he made my head spin, so I bet he'll make a lot of other guys' head spins. Uh, he's, but the thing is, Kenny's really great at breaking things down to like easy, easily, easy to digest bites. That's right. Good. Uh, yeah, it, that's, I think that's probably the biggest part of teaching a skill. Mm -hmm. It's just Absolutely. being able to communicate that skill and making it small bite sized pieces that everyone Absolutely. can digest. 
All right. Nicholas, thank you. I appreciate you tuning in and asking us great questions. If you guys have fence questions, be sure to drop them in the comments below. Sean and I could spend two, three, four days talking, but I'd rather answer your questions and try to be as helpful as possible for you guys. Probably could. Yeah. All right. How do you keep, how do y'all keep your guys from smoking while working? I've got a painter on my crew who smokes 24 seven, but outperforms the other guys, but stinks. Well, we've got a pretty firm rule that there's no smoking on customer's property. I mean, that's the same way. It, I fight it. I mean, I fight it. I get, I get, it's a habit. It's addiction for them. I get yeah. that. Um, we do have a no smoking policy on the job site. I'll allow you to go out by the truck in the street and, and do that. Yep. Uh, but it's also, you got to quantify, is it fair for them to take all the smoke breaks and everybody else to work hard all day? So, well, yeah. So that's the thing is, so we have mandatory breaks, even, even when it's not hot, we still have, we still have mandatory breaks. Um, and, and I'm fine with them smoking during that break, but to your point, if it starts becoming excessive, well then at that point, it's a conversation. It's not fair, right? It's not fair it's to not. the other guys. So. No, I, I mean, in, in this example, he's got a painter on his crew who smokes 24 seven, but outperforms the other guys. So. You know, maybe that's a conversation too, but I mean, it's very strictly no smoking on the property. I mean, that's just it because that's not always been the case for our company. You know, when it was owned by my granddad and all that smoking was a lot more common then. And we would get calls about cigarette butts in the yard or in the yep. plants or in the, what have you, uh, or guys that just, they could smell smoke and they're allergic to smoke and okay. So we just have a firm, no smoking policy. I don't mind if you smoke in and around the truck, but you won't smoke on the property. So for me, you know, and the smoking in the truck is a no go for me. Nice new trucks. I don't want to ever get in one of my trucks and smell it. So yeah. I pick battles. That's one of those, one of those battles, no job site, no wood trucks. And I don't want you to do it around me. If I'm not in the yard with you, I just don't want to smell it. That's all. Fair. And here's the thing is ultimately it's a case by case basis too. Yeah, I mean, company by company basis, too. All right. Northwest Skylighters. Vinyl fence for cedar board on board with steel post. Western Washington, Western Washington State, if that helps. Well, I'm a, I'm a wood guy, so I like wood on steel post. Sean's a vinyl guy. <laughs> I think you did this question on purpose. I, I think you're right. I, I have a <laughs> feeling there's ulterior motives afoot on this question. How are these two going to get along? This <laughs> All right. Conversation over. We'll see you guys later. Click. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. Uh, I mean, both. Either or. Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to put it on a steel post, guys, that's a hell of a way to build a wood fence. For sure. Yep. Yep. So. I mean, I, I think it, so it's really, to me, it's going to come down to aesthetics. Uh, what are you trying to accomplish with the fence? And what are the, the existing aesthetics of the house and property? Also, what's the norm in the neighborhood? or the community, you know, because the reason Sean does a lot of vinyl is because vinyl is prevalent in his area, probably more so than wood in my market. Wood is by far more prevalent than vinyl. There's some vinyl out there, but it varies regionally too. I think that uh, on steel posts, a lot, you know, my push for vinyl fence is longevity. Yeah. So yeah. lower maintenance longevity. Cedar is a great wood product if you're going to use one. And steel post is fantastic over pressure lumber. So let's, I mean, for me, I'm in a pressure treated market with pressure pickets and pressure posts, which is probably the least performing wood you could probably put in the ground. Absolutely. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the alternative is pushing to vinyl. Now, if you have the choice between vinyl fence and cedar, a cedar fence looks more natural. Most of us would think a cedar fence is going to have better appearance than a, a vinyl fence. Uh, but you still have to stain that fence. So yeah. You know, that cost associated to it. I, I don't think this would be a cost difference because by the time you stain the fence with steel post, you're probably a net wash between the two. Yep. I, think I agree. It's just, it's just looks. Which one do you like the looks of better? Yeah. You know, and I talked about this. Maybe we talked about this last week with Caleb. That might be why this question is coming up. Um, because I we had talked about staining fence. Caleb obviously owns stain and seal experts. So staining is going to come up in that conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, I was, my point was as far as maintenance and longevity, I would hazard to say a pre-stained cedar fence installed on steel post has generally the same lifespan or a similar lifespan. 
and probably the similar maintenance characteristics. You're going to have to clean both. You know, on a on a vinyl fence, we clean fence as well, so we end up cleaning vinyl fence that are yep. north facing. Yep. Because you're going to have you're just going to have algae growth on a north facing vinyl fence, just like you have it on vinyl siding. Um, on a pre stained cedar board fence, though, on steel posts, you're still going to want to clean it. Same reasons. Uh, so it, it boils down to what do you want the fence to accomplish, and what are the aesthetics of your home and area? I would say. That's about as as PC of an answer as you're going to get. We did good. We did good. <laughs> Jake Clark, when running a business where fence labor skills are involved, do you look to hire workers who have fence experience or do you like to hire someone with less to train them to build your way? Jake, incredibly good question. Awesome. John, what do you do? And I'll tell you guys what I do. <laughs> or or I'll go first. I don't mind. I, I feel like I put a lot of this on you first, Sean. So I would prefer to hire someone with no experience and train them to our ways and our standards rather than bring someone in with experience. The only reason is we've all had that team member who wants to make sure we understand how everyone else builds fence. And, and well, we did it this way and well, we went about it that way. And it comes to a point where, you know, you need to have a conversation like that's great. I love it, but this is the way we do it. You know, there, there are more than one ways to build if more than one way to build a fence. And this is just our way. So I was hard set for a long time that if you worked for any other local contractor, you were tarnished goods. You could not work. I would not hire you if you had previously worked for any other local fence contractor. That was the position I took for a while, and I would challenge that probably wasn't accurate, that probably wasn't fair, and I've grown since then and learned since then. Uh, by default, there's a, there, you have to consider hiring somebody else from somebody from another fence company is how difficult it's gonna be for you to get them on board with your process and procedure. Doesn't mean they're better or worse, right. but if you have a legit process and procedure, that's something that you can calculate, it's something that you can manage, predict, plan, uh, so you need everyone playing from the same playbook at the same time. And you don't want to have guys out there doing their own. You got to be able to control quality, yeah. not to mention efficiencies. And the other people coming up are going to be watching how they're building fence. So to answer the question, normally I shy away from it. Recently, I would say last couple of years, but even more recently, I have hired guys from other local companies because of this, I really feel confident that we have done a great job with our training in-house. We have installation manuals, we have videos, we've got test audio tracks to where they have a good chance of going through all that and actually realizing that our process and procedures work well. And there's yeah. really no reason not to use them and they're teachable and repeatable. So we've had some good success with that. Yeah. I agree. And, and I don't want to say that we won't hire anyone with experience. There's, there's definitely going to be a conversation involved. What was your experience there? What we're trying to get down to is there is no way I let rock stars go. You know what I mean? We're going to pay them as much as we can possibly pay them. We're going to treat them as good as we can possibly treat them. If they, if they leave or, or they are, you know, left to leave, um, there's usually a reason. So we're going to have that conversation, but sometimes the company's just not a good fit. Yeah. You know, we've hired guys like that before that said, well, I loved working for brand X, except for they always rushed me. They didn't let me do quality work. And the, you know, the materials were never there on time and you, you know, the main gripes. And so you kind of, you got to weigh that. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. It starts with a conversation, Jake. All right. This is a good question. Is there a math equation for to figure out how much to put into marketing? So I don't know if there's a math equation. Maybe the question is, is there a average in the industry? Yep. Yeah, it's usually a percentage. Yeah. It's sure. how I've heard it explained. Yeah. We, we use a percentage of of what our proposed revenue is for the following year. 
Yeah, your gross it's, revenue. Correct. Yeah, gross revenue. How much money do we want to bring in on fence? We'll spend, and it depends on the year and all that, somewhere between 5 and 8% of that number. Um, and, and it depends what stage of growth you're in as a company, too. 100%. If you're ready to grow and you're ready to just to eat all you can eat and you're ready to get with it, 10 or 12 percent, you know, something higher. If you're in the middle, if if you're not, if you're not, you know, I always say if, if you're not growing, you're dying. So you always need some level of growth. Uh, but if you're to, you know, a, a, a decent size, if you're in a comfortable place in your business, I think five to eight percent is a good place to be. I would challenge even say that growing doesn't always mean bigger. Growing doesn't mean sure. necessarily more revenue. Growing could be equal revenue, more efficient, higher profits, better yes. recession. Okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. So to quantify that now, so I agree with your term. If you're not growing, you're probably dying. Go back the other way with those parameters. Now, I see also newer companies spending probably more money to get aggressively to to grow aggressively. We did this in Florida. Uh, we, we were able to grow that company. Josh has grown that company rapidly with a lot more money put towards advertisement than we do in Indiana, um, even though most of how we operate is very similar. But I've had 25 years in Indiana to get my name out there and perfect how we advertise. I would also challenge you and say, it really comes down to how swifty you are at marketing your business. If you're lazy with it, I'm a quarter it, and you just want to pay somebody to do it, you're going to pay more money. If you just pay yep. for Google ads, Facebook ads, hire somebody to do it, and you don't even get involved with promoting your own business. And I mean by promoting like repping your own gear every chance you have, going to events that are free every chance you have, giving your name, like really working hard to give your card out to everybody, go ask for business. If you're not doing that, because that stuff is relatively inexpensive to the bottom line that costs yeah. you time and effort. Yeah. If you're not doing that, you're going to pay more money to somebody else. So yeah. I think we've done a fantastic job in Indiana over the years of finding ways of making our investment dollars for uh, advertising go a long way. It's like we never really high, we never did real ads, TV, billboards. We didn't do that because I didn't have the money to, Joe. <laughs> That's sure. really why. Yeah. Okay? But what we did do was we – Stuck that money into wrapping trucks, putting projects where they need to be, uh, talking to people in the community. This is before social media and that type of thing, but getting your sure. name out there that way. You know, a, wrapping a truck back then or graphics would be three or four thousand dollars. Well, that's how much a billboard costs you to run. Yep. Back and the billboard is a set period of time and in one spot. The truck yep. is for five, six years all over the place. Well, and the truck is specifically where people are doing business with your company. <laughs> right. I mean, they are. So rather than putting a billboard on a busy highway, here's the thing. So earlier we talked about efficiency and it's the same with marketing dollars. How efficient can you spend the, the dollars? So if you had a, if you had a million dollar ad budget and you spend it on yellow pages, probably oh, wouldn't be very effective. I mean, would would you get some phone calls? Sure. Would they yeah. be your ideal clients? Probably not. No. Uh, but if you if you use that ad marketing budget w by wrapping your trucks, I I am the hugest fan of mar of wrapping trucks. I I argue that it's probably one of the best or one of the most efficient dollars spent on marketing. Uh, I mean, it's big and orange, right? It <laughs> it grabs people's eyeballs and doesn't let them go, uh, and we're and it's in the neighborhoods that we're wanting to do business in. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a twofer. I like to call it. it's a twofer. And anyone that knows me would confidently knows that I agree with you a thousand percent. We we are driving ridiculously wrapped <laughs> chrome vehicles. Like the entire vehicle is wrapped in chrome, and then the Mister Vince Decker took on it. And that's everything. We had a Ford Fiesta wrapped, Raptor that's wrapped, giant work trucks that are wrapped. Yeah. Everything, right? Well, because it's a huge return ROI on your investment. Yes, yeah. it's in the neighborhoods of where your customers are. Bingo. It also is in the areas where your customers are going to, lumber yards and, and mm -hmm. material areas, right? Your customers yeah. live there as well. 
Yeah. Uh, if you make them different than everybody else, that's a key part. It's different. Bright orange, chrome, something to where you command attention driving down the road, and it's every single day. We even have um, some of those vehicles go home. So we're multiplying that advertisement even further. Yep. And then we went so far as we've been wrapping them with reflective lettering on the chrome. So like the Raptor <laughs> at night, it's just when your headlight hits it, you have to stop and wonder what is that I'm looking at. <laughs> it's commanding your attention. It's flashing yeah. and stuff. Uh, just like a stop sign would flash. Well, so, and, and right. that's the primary reason that emergency vehicles have reflective lettering. Yeah. They want to grab attention. I mean, for a different reason, but the same it's the same theory. They need to grab attention. Yeah. So is there a math equation to figure out how much to put into marketing? It's not an equation. I'd say it's a percentage. And you need to, you need to figure out if you're in a growth mode or not. But ultimately, you also need to put it into effective avenues of marketing. You know, make it to, work for you. So I think we would be in that neighborhood. Realistically, what I've seen is the the three to eight percent. Three to three to eight percent could be normal. It's going to be over eight if you're aggressive and with you want to grow. Maybe not too uh, intuitive how you do it. You waste some of your money. And yep. if you're below three percent, um, you either been around for a long time uh, or you're really not trying to grow and tell about who you are. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's the thing. You're not trying to grow, and so. The only, the only, I don't know, the only uh, guys and gals, defense company owners out there that aren't trying to grow should be the ones that are actively marketing their businesses to sell and are planning on retiring. Uh, well, actually, you know what? If you're marketing your business to sell, you better be marketing the business. I was going to say the same so, thing. I'm probably so, going to buy a business that's not be well marketed. Yeah. Yep. That's right. That's right. So the only time you wouldn't want to, you know, spend marketing dollars uh, would be you're not wanting to grow as if you're planning to retire and just close up shop. So Any other to, to follow up on that real quick, I get oftentimes guys say, well, I don't have the money to pay that for advertisement because I don't have enough work. It, it, it kind of comes first. Yeah. You have to pay it first and the work will follow. Yeah. So that's, see. I see that a lot in our industry is, is guys that, that pull their foot off the accelerator for marketing in the winter time because they yeah. don't have as much work and yeah. you really, you have to flip that. Hammer it out. You have to. I mean, yeah. you, I mean, if if in the summertime, if you're covered up, I mean, we've all seen guys in the Facebook groups that are three or four or five months booked out, whatever. So you shouldn't, those, the marketing dollars you're spending then are probably not as effective. If you're exactly. turning away work because you're so far behind, then yeah. you're probably, it's probably not effective. So in the oh, summertime, goodness. we ramp our marketing down. Now we don't turn it off because we still need our brand out there in the marketplace, but we're spending more marketing dollars in our off season than we are in our peak season. Okay. All right. Let's see. Jason has a good question. Say you have an eight or 10 foot fence. What measurements do you set your brackets for your runners? For us, I know, I know, Sean, your measurements are a little bit different. We use sixes, so six inch from the top, six inch from the bottom, middle rail on center. We're, right there too. Whether it's it's six, eight, two. Yeah. Uh, we do very, I don't know if we do any 10 foot wood fence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the eight foot wood fence, we end up with a seven inch reveal on top and nine, eight and a half inches on the bottom. Um, one in the middle, we'll actually end up with additional rail, four rails on that. So they'll be yeah. equally. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, and it really doesn't matter one way or the other, whether it's six, eight, 10 foot, it's always the same on the top, same on the bottom. And then like you said, yeah, 10 foot, 10 foot fence. You wouldn't see that in a, in a wood. I wouldn't think, but here's a good question. Fishing and picking. He's been with us for a while. Thank you for sticking around with us for the live broadcast. Wants to know if your rock stars become competition. Yes. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> All the time. I mean, it's, well, well, it's good, bad, or ugly. I can tell you that probably at least half the companies that I compete with daily started or worked for us at one time. Yep. Yep. Uh, agreed. Agreed. I mean, it, whether they're, we've had guys that started out as subcontractors, so they had their own trucks, tools, and equipment. Uh, they just wanted us to run the business side of things, which is fairly common. 
uh, or we just we they worked for us directly and we trained them up from you know all the way from apprentice up to crew chief and then they decided that they were going to go it on their own i mean I, I think it happens all the time um and, and it's a nat I, I feel like it's a natural progression it's going to happen uh, you need to train your guys so well that they can leave you know that's that's the thing is a lot of guys kind of I don't know. I don't want to say they're scared of, of overtraining, but they're hesitant to overtrain, you know, everyone except for their most loyal, you know, employees. And and you're really doing yourselves and your clients a disservice. You know, it's they, they really are scared to train them, Joe. Yeah. I hear it. Tell me, I'm scared. But here's the deal. Think about it this way. Stop for just a second and imagine if you don't train that team member and they stay. That or that's the stay. that's the saying is Yo, so what happens if they leave? Like, oh, better question. What happens if they stay? <laughs> yeah, that's the bigger problem. And that's the one that's going to cost you money. Oftentimes, oh. we think because they leave, they're going to cost us money because they're competing against us. They will cost you less money running another business than they will working for you untrained. Yeah. Yes. I confidently yeah. believe you're going to yep. have more problems, more mistakes that will directly affect your pocketbook. Yep. And if they leave, you're running. And I've had this happen multiple times. Guys have left me, go start their own business, and gotta freak out there for a minute. The reality of it is, man, there's so much work out there. I don't know a fence guy really that is starving for work. Most of the time, it's no. I'm backed up three, four months. I'm like, are you crazy? Three, four months? But that's what I hear more yeah. often than I have no work. Like, yeah, and I'll, I'll interject here. If you're a guy that's got three or four or five months of work booked up then I would argue that you are severely underpriced for the value that you're bringing to the market. Or you're not, you're not fully utilizing your resources. Absolutely agree. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's my thing. So in our business, we, that's one of the pricing cues that we watch is how far out are we booked? So for us, my sweet space is anywhere from four to six weeks. That's kind of uh, my comfort zone. If we get above we six weeks, I firmly believe the market, that's a signal that the market is sending me that I'm underpriced for the value. Yeah, um, so great, you know, great. I had this conversation with, uh, with, uh, Mr. Spence in Florida this morning. They're so backed up. It just lets you raise the prices. Just go up. Uh, we like to operate in that three to four, win three to four week window is where I feel comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I try to make sure our resources are smashing that out because, if you go too far out, like these guys are three months and four months out, the reality of it is you're losing opportunity yep. to put in fence because you, you, if you get that much work, you can get more resources in place. But I think the hesitation, Joe, is people struggle with trying to find a way to put a team out there to build fence that isn't an artist who hasn't grown up in a business, who doesn't, yep. who can't do it on autopilot. And that's why the process and procedures and the methods are so important. So it's not an artist building your fence. It's not a technician. It's not this amazing fence guy that has 30 years experience. Yeah. Break it down to where it's simplistic and that uh, it's teachable. Yeah, that absolutely. And what I view, so scaling is always kind of, for me is always a little bit uncomfortable. We're like, we're at a comfortable place now that as far as how many team members we have and the production we put out, but we still get behind in the summertime. Like there's just no way around it what makes me uncomfortable is hiring more team members than I can keep on staff over the winter. Winter time. Cause you don't want to lose them. You don't. And well, cause here's the thing, Sean, you know, this better than I do probably is that, all right. So if you're only hiring summer help or summer crews, you're going to turn loose of them in late October, early November is kind of when, at least in Missouri, kind of when our season winds down. All right. So you're telling me that I need to sit someone down and let them know that I'm turning them loose right before Thanksgiving. No, probably not. All right. So we've got, we're going to put, we're going to kick that can down the road. Well, the next month is Christmas. So you're certainly not going to do it then. So you're telling me you're going to turn them loose in January after carrying them through a few months only to then need to rehire in March and April. Yeah. So I, there, there are companies out there that do, you know, they'll, they'll just, tell guys, you know, I'll go grab unemployment for a few months and then I'll call you in the spring when I'm ready. Uh, I had to, I'm not comfortable with that. So I've been there, Joe. I've been the guy that did that. I have been the guy that had to lay off for survival. Been doing this business long enough that I didn't know 
what I know now. Sure. And yeah. We didn't, know, we didn't know. So I did that. And I can tell you, for the guy that's done it and a guy that no longer does it, the value and the difference I see in the team members and the culture of people that we have on staff is totally different than the employees that we were trying to hire for years and then complained about the service and the productivity we got out of them. So, yeah. Yes. I- you got to find, you know, how to take care of your team. I want to pause and recognize the terms you use there. Team members and employees. Yep. Those are two different mindsets. To- totally different mindsets. And it takes a lot. Uh, I have a guy in my office yesterday. I'll share this with you. It was kind of funny. He was, he was a financial advisor and my banker and him were in here. We're talking probably for an hour. And uh, we were discussing everything from uh, investing in our company and even so far as ESOPs. And he kept using the word employee. After about the fourth time, I had to stop him. That's how passionate I am about it. The fourth time, I looked at this professional man, vice president of the major accounting firm, and I explained to him, I said, you mean, you mean team member? Yep. And he kind of looked at me and goes, uh, yeah. And I let it go, and he did it again. I said, team member. And he's, he's like, you're really aggressive with that. I said, no, it's a choice. Because if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to promote and try to, to build a team of team members, that word leaves our vocabulary, step one. And everyone around me is not going to call or refer to my team as employees, period. And he was just impressed. He's like, you're on it. So for the next hour, I would be like, team member, <laughs> team member. And he's like, you're not going to stop. I said, I'll catch you every time. And, and at the end of the day, he got it pretty well, but he walked away. And I felt good because I, I'm a firm believer in team members. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different mindset. You know, I, I view employees as impersonal and not long-term, short-term employees. We don't, we don't have employees. Yeah. We've got, we we've did. got quite a few team members. We did. And it, we it's a culture shift. It takes some time. You have to cut the cancer out sometimes, but when you have team members, the conversation is less likely to hit 10 towards bottom dollars what they get paid and more likely to, to, to go towards what can I do for the team? I love appreciation. How can I make a bigger impact? That's exponentially going to grow your business faster than having somebody about me, 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 me. The employee, employer, whole conversation is a his and a hers. It's a separate, it's a them and an I. And the easiest step is just start referring to anyone in your company as a team member, as a leader. That's step one. That's the easy thing to do. That's right. One of the tagline... Manual. I mean, we took the time to go through and eliminate the word employee from every document yep. in this company. So, so what is it? So do you have a team member handbook then? Yes. yes. That, that's, I see that term used employee handbook all over everywhere. And I was like, you cannot sound more, you know, corporate and lack of feeling and in, you know, empathy than calling it an employee handbook. So, so oftentimes people will say, I can't find any good help. There's no good help left out there. Uh, I mean, I, and I would want to challenge them and suggest it's the way you're looking at it. It's your perspective. It's what you're looking for. Stop and start looking for a team member, which probably is not going to be a trained Pence guy from another Pence company. It could just be a young kid with a great attitude. Yeah. That can be teachable in the process. And then think about would you want to stay working for a company that thought about you like a pawn or a resource and, yep. and used up and spit out, work six days a week, 10, 12 hours a day, yelled at because you made mistakes, not given the training you need to do your job the best way you possibly can? I don't think I'd want to. I don't think I'd. The only people that no. will stay are people that are money hungry. The only people that are going to stay are people probably looking for or the employee looking for a bottom dollar. Well, so, and, and, if, and if you do have you – know, you know, if you have folks that are only money motivated and are there for the dollar, guess what happens when someone offers them more dollars? Gone. They gone. They gone. Like it's they're gone. So yeah, it's that it's the tagline we use a lot in our marketing is we're the first family of fence in south south southwest Missouri. It'd, it'd be great if I could say that correctly, being that it's one of our taglines. But we're the first family of fence. So. And, and when, when someone leaves us a good review and when we're talking to people, we always say, welcome to the Ozark Fence family. Yep. So why would we be talking out family out of one side of our mouths, but not talk family out of the other side? 
know, why would we say that to the customers, yeah. clients, and not to our team members? Just because that's the way we grew up. If you've grown up in a business, I grew up in a business, everything was employee growing up. It was yep. the way that we yep. thought it before. Yep. So it's just a matter of changing your perspective, your thought process, and how you treat your team. I often will think about them first, then myself. Like, how does it look to them? How is this going to make their life easier or better every single day? If yep. you start there, uh, your team will start to um, take more pride in their work. If you're going to see it payback tenfold, I mean, it's going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they're part that they are part of it. Yeah. They're not simply someone that's there to uh, their only role is to, you know, better the company. They're there to be a part of it. So nice little tangent there. It's something I, I think, I think we're both really passionate about. So it's easy for us to, to run you off did, on that uh, tangent. Yeah. I could spend an hour talking about team members. A hundred percent. All right, Jake, Jake says great information. Thanks guys. Also shout out to Sean. He's the, Mouse. <laughs> you must be from the South. I'm guessing so. I'm guessing so. I have to think of a leader, maybe not a boss. <laughs> Jason Reese says, I'm looking for information on how to attend the Fence Academy in Nashville. I can't find anything. Where can I go? The description below. Jason, it's like the fight club. You can't talk about it. It's top oh. secret. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Then I better take it out of the description then real quick. Uh, yeah. No, there's a clickable link in the description. It'll take you to a uh, little bit of information. It's also a Google sign up. Um, I'm a yeah. fence guy, so I don't know the term for the uh, Google doc. Uh, no, nope, Google doc's not the right one. Yeah. I think all that's going through Caleb Roth, uh, yes. Cell experts. He's the one handling all that. Um, yep. We're just, I'm just a volunteer to participate in his event. Yeah. Uh, giving up my time to kind of help the industry out because we normally get around – Yep. together that time of year we can't because of COVID this year that's right so guys if you look in the description i'll just go through what's in there just briefly so we've got a uh, standing university and fence installation school 2021 that's the first link you see there then we've got more information about mr fence tools is going to be the second one uh stainless steel experts sponsors our live broadcast so you've got some information in there uh, also you've got a link to subscribe to the channel but i'm sure everyone watching right now is already subscribed so you don't even need to worry about that uh, but yeah, so first link in there gets you uh, information and in, in a uh, online sign up straight into it. All right. So Jay says in Texas, there's a lot of 10 foot fence. Yes. I've noticed that. I've talked to some guys in Texas. It's very true. Uh, so, I've even seen some really cool videos. These guys building 10 foot fence with steel posts. Yeah. So I have a, a little hairy scary on those ladders. I mean, they're up on way up there. They're up there. Well, I mean, <laughs> If they're driving them four and a half foot, so yeah. that's a that's a fourteen and a half foot post when you uh, start it. Yep, I, the one I saw was in the front yard of the house, which blew me away. Ten foot tall in the front yard of the house. Dang. Yeah, it was. Hey, it was I, a good looking fence. They did a great job. <laughs> Our city inspectors, their heads would explode. <laughs> yeah. Like they would just, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves. Right. Uh, so in, in here in Springfield are, so if it's a fence forward of the front corners of the house, it's got to be no taller than 48 inch and it has Same to be 50% open. Oh, so yeah. if you're doing a picket fence using four inch pickets, it's got to have a four inch gap. Wow. So now does that mean that everyone follows those rules? No, but we do work for the city. So we are absolutely following all the rules. Uh, and we've, and it's, it's in the permits and it's all that, but yeah, so a 10 foot fence in the front yard that they just wouldn't know what to do with themselves. Rock stars to competition. Why not look to franchise? Ooh. So that's been done before or wow. been tried before franchising. That is, uh, I can tell you that I actually franchised Mr. Fence in 2007 and it cost me a ton of money just for the documents. It was like 80,000 bucks for just the legal documents. Yep. And it yep. was not a good fit for us. We started a franchise and put an operation nearby, spent years developing it. And end of the day, the guy ended up just leaving and doing it on his own anyways. Yeah. And here's the yeah. thing is these rock stars that are leaving, they're not going to other communities. They are, they've already got their family. They're staying in your community to work. So, I mean, you're not going to franchise competition into your own area. Um, I mean, because here's the thing, like, let's talk about the reality that a new fence company on average lasts no more than three to five years. 
Right. You know, just because because these guys are rock stars at their trade, they're rock stars at building fence. They're generally not rock stars at running a business because those are typically two different skill sets. Yep. So I find, I find there's some very successful fence guys, believe it or not, that have very very little fence experience. I've talked to them. They, they have so, no idea how to build fence, but they're good at running a business. It's different. There's a guy. There's a guy I know that runs a fence company that does. Let me let me think of the numbers here. Say so eight figures. So tens of millions of dollars in revenue who has never built a fence in his life. I believe it. Just I hasn't. Really believe it. So, but he is incredibly good at establishing process. Yep. Like that's, if you sit down for 30 seconds with him, you're going to understand that's what his life is about creating process and order. Uh, process and order and then measuring some sort of matrix, right? So if you have a process, yes. that means you have data. Uh, and that's what we really focus on with us is that we have, we, we have the data. Now, what do you do with the data? So, yep. uh, you know, what gets measured improves and what gets measured and reported improves exponentially. So looking at the data and talking about the data, sharing the data is when you see the growth. And it takes people that know their numbers, KPIs, and can understand it to actually uh, educate it to your team. Yeah. You probably don't know what that means. Yeah, this guy does twenty in peak season does like twenty three jobs a day. Wow! You you had better have you'd better have a process, and to your point, you'd better have KPIs because when you're running that hard that fast, things can get out of whack in a hurry. Real quick. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, you better believe he has daily KPI meetings with yeah. depending on different different departments in his business to make sure okay, marketing's on point. We've got sales on point. We've got production on point. Make sure we're firing on all cylinders. And each each of those divisions are going to have different KPIs, yeah. right? The marketing department is not concerned with how many feet of fence got built that day. They're concerned with how many leads came in that were properly qualified. For sure. Well, this is a good question. Alex Samuel asked, does fencing add value to your property or is it aesthetically a knock against, especially if you're in a rural area with a nice house, with nice houses 15 to 20 feet apart, but it's not being used across the board? So I would suggest a fence can absolutely add value, but it can also hurt your value. If you have a dilapidated, horrible looking fence, you're better off with no fence. If you have a gorgeous fence that fits the property, makes sense, and is not a maintenance nightmare for the next customer or homeowner, well, then you might have some value. Yep. Yep. So the three things that keep a fence company in business, my granddad used to always say, it's kids, it's pets, and it's bad neighbors. Three key, three key things that keep a fence company in business. And you have to think if you're selling your house, what are the chances that an incoming buyer has kids or pets? Pretty right. good chance. But it's funny. We say it's kids, pets, and security, which is almost the same thing. Okay. As neighbors, right? Yeah. But yeah, the same three things I think to tell me. Those are the three reasons why we're in a business. For us in the residential world, believe it or not, it's primarily number one, the animals. Kids are second. Yep. Security is third. Yep. For us, if we were to quantify all of our clientele, our number one client is putting the fence in for our dog. They just got a puppy. That's why. Yep. Yep. And then 100%. it's security or privacy. And then it's kids out of a pool, out of a pond, out of a lake. Yep. 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 I mean, and, and you'll have, you'll have outliers in there, but yeah, if you survey the majority of our customers in 2020, 95% will have one of those three issues. So, but Sean's, I agree with Sean when he says, so a properly built fence that is in keeping with the community and the house will absolutely add value. Um, but we've all driven down the road and driven through a neighborhood and seen a handful of fences that don't match the aesthetics. You know, they're just completely out of place or they're just simply not built well. And a fence that's not built well, if I'm an incoming homeowner or home purchaser and I'm looking at this house, the first thing, and I'm a fence guy, I get it, but I'm going to look at the fence and think, is this something I'm going to have to put money into right away? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, and that's, we work a lot with real estate agents specifically with gates. So 
they're going to walk into the backyard because they want to see how big this yard is. If that gate sticks and then you got to drag it and pick it up and move it, that's your first impression of that backyard. But if that gate swings free and clear, it's easy to open, it closes solidly and firmly, that's a good impression. So I would go so much as in a different context. That's how we are judged by our customers on every job we build. Yeah. They interact and they touch and feel the gate. If you have a junky gate, they're probably going to tell all their friends and family your fence is junk, even if it's great. Yep. If you have a decent fence with an amazing gate, they're going to brag about your fence because at the end of the day, they're not using the fence panels but they are using the gate and the hardware every time they go into the yard. That's why the gates are so important for longevity feedback. I mean, take the time to do the gate, right? Yeah. A hundred percent. So when we're building, when we're building, we, we primarily build wood fence. Uh, when, we're, when we're building gate, regardless of the materials being used, there are always steel posts, steel frames and hardware that attaches directly from the steel post to the steel frame yeah. because Sorry. less callbacks, it's not going to warp, twist, drag, sag, whatever. Uh, and it closes It closes like a door, meaning that when it closes, thud. Yep. It's solid, firm closure. A lot of gate hardware out there, when you close it, you get a rattle. Yep. And that's that's the biggest feedback. When we get feedback in reviews about, our, about the fence and quality, gates are number one. This thing closes like a door. Yep. So... Uh, and Alex kind of clarified there, uh, he's talking about houses that are, this is very specific, $333,000 and above. Yeah. I mean, I think these are houses that are going to have more disposable income. So they're more likely to have pets and kids. So I would think it would probably make more of an impact in my market. These houses primarily are all built with fences. So whether the builder contracts it or we prefer to deal with the end user, the home uh, whoever the home is being built for, um, they typically all have fences around them. All right. Devin Mooney says, I got hired in January. It happened. Right. Yeah, it happened. So, I mean, right now, right now we're actively looking for team members for 2021 because we've got some training to do. And I, we really don't want to train when, when the ship is taken off. Or, so. Yeah. Same. Yeah. But yep, congrats, De Devin. Hutch says, I got to run off. Thanks for doing this at Joe Everest. This was very informative. Hutch, appreciate you coming in. Hey, and hey. Sean's doing a good job, too. So it should be at Sean, too. Come on now. Oh. Brandon says, I started in July of last year, and, and what you guys put out there has drastically helped me through the learning curve. Thank you so much. Awesome. Brandon, you are exactly why this channel exists. And why Sean and I take out time to just sit here and, and do live Q and a that, I mean, that I'm probably going to print this off and put it out around here somewhere uh, be, because that is the reason like, the, Brandon is the reason and, and, and guys and gals like Brandon are the reason that this channel exists and the reason that, that Sean and I, and there's others too. I don't want to say it's just us, but we're so passionate to help because I mean, everyone starts somewhere. Right. I mean, Ozark sure. fence has been around since 1955, but in 1955, we just got started. <laughs> yeah. Everyone starts somewhere. I would say it's almost part of a responsibility. Those that have been successful in the industry kind of need to uh, give back. Right. So the fence industry has been fantastic for me and my livelihood for, I don't know, well over 30 years. I grew up in the business. Right. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like a full circle. Now we need to give back and help those that are just getting started. That's one part of the token makes you feel good. The other part yeah. of it is how can we sit here and talk about raising professionalism and increasing our industry and ignoring the core people that are going to make the difference in our organization, our, our professionalism in our industry 10 years from now. That's the That's new right. guy. That's absolutely correct. So it there's too many people trying to keep things close, close to their chest and on the cuff because before it was thought of, I don't want to educate my competition because they might beat me. You know what? Fantastic. Let my competition see everything I'm doing and maybe I'm going to learn from them as well. I'm going to raise the whole bar and hold each other accountable. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. That, that, that is absolutely right. So here's the two, the two sayings that I say all the time. You guys are sick of hearing them by now, but a rising tide raises all the ships. So yeah. by raising professionalism 
in the industry, we also raise ourselves. You can also build a, you can build the tallest building one of two ways. You can tear all, you can tear down all the buildings around you, or you can build the tallest building. Or build a taller one. That's right. So I would prefer, you know, if we're building a tall building, I would be, I would prefer to be surrounded by other tall buildings. It's a matter of keeping yourself honest. If you think you're going to win and beat your competition by keeping them in the dark, that's not how to win on the same playing field. How about win with equal resources, equal talents, equal talent? And that gives you something. You're going to better yourself. You're going to win because you improve by someone else pushing you. If no one's pushing right. you and no one competition is as good as you are and uh, they haven't figured it out yet, it's going to start yourself. You are, are, are hurting yourself. That's what's happening. Well, and think of competition in these terms. If, if, if you're an NFL you know, team, if you're the Kansas City Chiefs, and I bring them up because they're going to win Sunday in the Super Bowl, but if you're the, the Kansas City Chiefs, do you feel any pride at all smashing a high school football team? Right. No. Exactly. No. I mean, that's that's not that's not quality competition. You don't feel right about that. No. Now, now when they go out on the field Sunday and they just absolutely crush it with a team that is their, I don't know about their equal, but their rivals. Uh, I think there's going to be a bit more pride in that. Sure. Right. And, and I think that's part of it, but For Brandon, sure. thank you. I appreciate you showing up and I appreciate you, you know, just letting us know that it's, that it's appreciated. All right. So N- Northwest Skylighters, I actually missed this question earlier. I remember seeing it and I skipped it. I apologize. Uh, advice on approaching neighbors who share a fence line with you on sharing costs and such. Do you walk through each estimate you got with them as well. So, I encourage, I encourage every client that shares a fence line to approach their neighbors. If anything, just to say, Hey, by the way, I'm going to replace this fence or I'm getting ready to build a fence. I want to let you know. And I wanted to see if you had any feedback on that because more often than not, they're probably thinking about building a fence too. So in, when I first got into business in California with my, my family, it was very, very common for a shared fence to be split in cost. That was a normal conversation. You didn't put a fence up without talking to the neighbor on the property line, and then there'll be a shared cost. In Indiana, it's extremely rare. I I mean, it's it's like a unicorn. Nobody here splits a cost on a fence at all, ever, anywhere. I, I can probably count out of, I mean, thousands and thousands of fences less than five or 10 fences anyone's has shared the cost. So wow. we get the phone call, we put the fence in two to six inches inside the property line. Yeah. And then the next neighbor might come and add uh, uh, close to it on either sides. If they do split the cost, we leave it on the consumer to do that. You guys yeah. split the lot. Here's the bill. You pay me. You guys can split it up. Yep. But it's weird in this area. It is so uncommon to see a shared cost. And That's like cool. Or, or else, or rather, when I talk to fence guys in other areas, it's common for them. Yeah. I know it was for us in California, it was a shared cost, but here we don't yeah. have it. Yeah, here in Missouri, it's, it's incredibly common for neighbors to share. Um, but to your point, even when neighbors do share, we still step in six inches inside our customer's property. Um, wow. And it, it's so common that we have a policy that we don't do multi-party billing. So we're going we're gonna to bill one client now. To your second question, do you walk through each estimate you got with them as well? You know, if you're the homeowner walking your neighbors through, I don't think so. I think you find the qualified bid that you're comfortable going with, and then you share that with the neighbors. So what we do is we'll typically break, if we know that there's, you know, neighbors participating in the cost, we'll break it down by section. You'll have your total bid, but we'll also denote that the West line equals this many dollars, the, you know, each line costs this much money. And so then you can approach your neighbors and say, Hey, here's the cost of this. What do you think about helping me out with that? Because you're also getting a new fence. It's yeah. pretty common, but at the end of this project, we're going to build one customer. We're not going to build four or five different people. That's right. Because if we place a lien, we can't place a lien on four or five properties. We're going to place a lien on one property. So anyway, yeah. hope that helps Northwest Skyliers. I apologize for missing it uh, the first time around. Steve Erdman says, hi, Joe, Steve from Twin Pines Fencing here. Hello, Steve. I would like to know how you keep a good straight line in windy conditions. Sean, if only there was a tool for something Mm -hmm. like that. Man, wouldn't that that be something? 
Steve, I don't say that to be sarcastic. I'm sorry. That as as I'm saying that, I'm like, this sounds really sarcastic. Yeah. Sean, you have a tool that can do something like that. We do, and, and there's also there's so there's two trains of thought. So you have some guys will say, well, I just backside them and, and not use a string line, and that's yeah. absolutely doable and teachable. It's a trait that can be learned for sure. Um, Mark Olson's got some videos on that yeah. on how to get started with that. Yep. So for us, a lot of it goes back to process and procedures repeatable and measurable for guys with very little experience, not necessarily someone who has the ability to backside fence. With a windy string, first off, we don't even like using string lines, period. Yep. We would use, uh, if it's a vinyl fence, we'd be using a steel marker cable that has crimps on it that shows exactly where the post goes. The wind's not going to move that. We'll mid-stick that thing every 60 foot or so. Um, if we're going to wood fence, we're using the equalizer, which is a quarter-inch shock cord. Uh, we would mid-stick that as well. Um, so that holds a pretty true straight line. Um, so I, I, don't, I, you know, I get this question a lot, but the reality of it is most of the fences we're building are not over 150 foot per line. Yep. Yep. And even if you even if you do use a string line and you don't have these other tools, mid-stick it. So get it up, sign yep. in your mid-sticks two or three times. And you can use a string line and get a mistake. Just don't dare do the whole thing. Now, I don't know if maybe he's talking about running pickets on the top. That would be a whole other ball game. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So as, as we were, as I was thinking this through while you're talking, I was like, I wonder if he's talking about running pickets. Um, let me address post first. So as Sean said, if it's really windy, we use we use a string line some of the times. It's going to happen. Um, but mid staking, so running two or three stakes in between that line. Making yeah. sure they're in, they're in line is really going to help against that. Also, making sure the line is really tight. Um, we we don't we won't use a string or or anything like a string uh, running fence pickets. Yep. For that, you use a we call it a jig. A lot of guys a lot of guys have different terms for it. Um, why don't you describe what you've got there? So we have a stainless steel track system. We call straight away something that's a jig. We've literally been using this thing. My dad taught me to use this thing, I think, in the early 90s. That's how long we've been using this thing uh, to run the pickets on top. But in order to use it, it follows the rails. So the whole entire process of building the fence uh, is a little different. Like you have to make sure you, you can't. The guys who string lines sometimes will have a reveal of a change. Like they'll float over a high or low post to make the pickets look good. With the yep. system that we have, your rails are going to have to look just as good as the top of the picket, so the whole system's got to be smooth on top. But no string lines for us to run on top of the pickets, and we have not used string lines for that since the early 90s. Yeah, so so Steve just just uh, clarified is for setting posts. Okay. So, so take the first part of our advice. There you go. <laughs> also, Steve's been in business going on four years in the middle of Tennessee. That's awesome. So, Steve, yeah. you should come to – you should come to the event at the end of the month. It's going to be oh, yeah. just, outside, just outside Nashville and Lebanon. So it's probably going to be in your backyard and we'd love to meet you in person and maybe, uh, maybe pick up a tip or trick or two from you. From him. Yep. Chris has a good point. Our team works with me, not for me. I worked in that atmosphere for years. If it would have been different, I most likely would still be there. So Sean, you had a, you, you said, I, you said a good, you had a good phrase earlier. Um, that I didn't pick up on until just now. You had said it's you. You're creating an atmosphere that you would want to work in. Well, yes, absolutely. At the end of the day, if you guys would just look at the way your the perspective, look at your company from your team members' perspective. In other words, from the lowest guy on the totem pole, the newest guy, the installer, the laborer on your teams. Just think for a minute how the whole organization looks. How does it sound? How does it sound when he comes to work in the morning? Does he hear yelling and screaming and bitching and moaning? Does he hear negativity? Does he see negativity? Does he see – what is he looking and seeing? Like, stop and really think about that. And it puts some of his shoes. If that was you, would you be looking for another job? Would you be happy? Yep. Would you yep. be positive? Like set him up to win. Give him the best chance possible. Just like – Oftentimes I'll hear um, managers, owners of fence companies complain tremendously about mistakes that are made by their team in the field and just go off about how you idiot, you did this, did that, did this. Stop and think what kind of training did you actually give them besides yeah. for saying one time you told them how to do it. Sure. Right? That's not going to work. I I'll give you, for example, uh, analogy. I was in law enforcement for, for close to 10 years. 
And I went to the academy, and in the academy, I learned how to shoot a gun. I didn't shoot a gun prior to the academy. And I uh, was top shot in the academy. So everybody in the academy, I had top shot. It was the best shot in the academy. When I got back to duty back home after 17 weeks of training, I still had to learn how to shoot a gun uh, and test it two times a year. Tested, but had to practice every month. So, so, so if I had to do that for a simple thing as shooting a gun and I was already top shot, we tell somebody how to build a fence and say this this way. We never talk about it again. You wonder how they forgot or made a mistake. Did you give them the opportunity to learn that again and again and again? Like, do you practice it? Do you talk about it? Do you write it down? Yeah, that's and that's kind of where my head goes to. You know, whenever there, whenever there's a mistake made or a failure somewhere, like I, you always got to think about it in the terms of like, well, how could I have prevented that from happening? Yeah. yeah. Like, it's all about me yeah. in the terms of like, I should do a better job at creating more training opportunities or explaining more clearly what the expectations were to begin with. Um, my, my dad used to, uh, he still says it every time you point a finger, you got three more pointing back at you. So just think about that. You point a finger, you got three more pointing back at you. Um, I think more than that, it's, it's because people try really, really hard and the mistakes lack of training. It's sure. not so often or common that the mistakes are made because of malicious, because they no. purposely don't care. It happens, but sure. it's not. No, I, I, I agree. There, there's a reason that, that the mistake was made. So let's learn from it. Let's try to figure out if there's retraining that needs done or there's just more training in general on that subject matter. Like how did it, how did it happen and how can we prevent it from happening again? Or Joe, sometimes maybe you as an owner, you never actually determined how that was supposed to be done. Right. Like that's be fair. Right. Yeah. It's, you, like did not set any protocol and you just allowed everybody to be an artist and figure it out. And you're like, I don't like that way. Well, cool. What's the right way? Well, not that. Right. That's right. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what I want, but I know that's not it. Right. How frustrating would that be? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Alex Samuel. Thanks guys. I've been a subscriber for a while, but my first time watching live Q and a welcome Alex to the live Q and a he, li he lives in North Carolina. So Alex, I'd like to know what part of North Carolina you lived in or you live in. I was actually born in North Carolina. So I'd like to hear about where about you are. Um, so, so what, what organization do I contact to find a quality fence builder? The first Easter fence, uh, Easter fencing is the first um, fence company I ever sold tools to and consulted with in 2006. And he was just here two weeks ago, drove his truck across country and picked up another truckload. Daniel Easter is the person you want to give up. It's a, a solid company. Uh, look him up, give him a call. There you go. Yeah. So if if Easter isn't in your neck of the woods in North Carolina, I would recommend, or, or if anyone else is watching and has this question, I'd reach out to the American Fence Association. I'd start there. Solid. Uh, yep. Yeah. Start there. And then, and then honestly, do some homework from there, right? So American Fence Association is a great place to start. And then the reason I say do homework from there is you're probably going to get three or four names, right? Yep. So then you, I, I would go to social media, Facebook, Yelp, it's whatever is prevalent in your area, to check reviews, Google, et cetera. Um, and then just kind of go from there. But I would start with the AFA or Easter fence if they're in your neck of the woods. <laughs> Jason Weber has been in the business for a little over a year. Have had some success with a pay per lead company. But I'm wanting to boost my advertising. What's the next step? I, I my opinion is you can't leave the pay per lead company fast enough. Uh, well, they're competing with they are competing with your brand. They, you are paying them to go find your clients and bring them to you. What they're also doing is they're competing with you to go find those clients. I mean, ultimately, you want to go find those projects for yourself. And and paper, I, I have a whole rant and rave about paper lead in general. I don't think it's effective. I think it's predatory in, in a lot of regards. Um, what's the next step? If you're asking me, I say create a lot of video content. That's, that is my whole thing. That's what we're doing today. Uh, yeah. A lot of content about you and your brand and your company, what you are and who you, who, what you do and who you are and, and where you service, that sort of thing. The, the best time you can spend is letting your clients meet you before they meet you. Meaning, 
video content about what you are, what you offer. You know, I prefer, I like Facebook and now YouTube, uh, for, for our brand, for the actual fence company, we still prefer YouTube or in, in Facebook, but we prefer YouTube. Uh, I mean, anything can work, I guess, but the more you do yourself, the better you'll be for it because you're not paying a company to compete with you for these leads. So that's the, low, my opinion. the lowest hanging fruit is going to be make sure that all your information digitally is accurate across all platforms. So make sure you have a Facebook page, make sure you have a Google My Business page, a Yelp page, a yep. Better Business Girl page, yep. a LinkedIn page. Make sure you have all of these pages and, and make sure they have valid, accurate content of who you are and why you're different than anybody else, okay? Make sure that there's something on there that's unique. For Joe, it's very clear it's orange. It's orange everywhere. For me, it's blue yep. everywhere. It can be as simple yep. as a color, a slogan, an icon, something, but that's tremendously more effective than paying someone to bring leads to your door that as soon as you stop paying, you have nothing. Like yeah. you're forced to keep paying. Or, You've got to start building something that's going to stay there for a while. Right? Yeah. Uh, attend better, go and attend local uh, meet and greets. There's all sorts of stuff yeah. from, from B&I yeah. meetings that, that cost you a little bit of money to Chamber of Commerce meetings, Business Barrel meetings, your Builder Association meetings. Get out there, get involved with where your clients are. Uh, yep. I would even say go to Little League sponsorships for ball, ball games, barter, do a little free work, get some advertisement out there. We have a ton of that. Uh, very little investment out of pocket to go fix a fence and put a sign on or yep. uh, repurpose a fence. We've even used use fencing and donated before for yep. uh, advertisement. So. Yeah, local chamber shows are a great opportunity. They're typically not very expensive for a booth, but it gets you in front of the community. Um, yeah, I mean, anything you can do to, to get out there and meet your clients, I mean, meet your future clients, that's the money best spent. Because with the pay per lead, what happened? You know, there's so much that can go wrong there. You know, what, what would you do tomorrow if the price tripled per lead? I don't know, but you better figure that out because what happens if it does, you know, or. The thing, I don't know, there, I got a few problems with paper leads because also I'm not, there's a lot of them that you're not the only fence guy getting that lead. Tell us how you really feel, Joe. Yeah, I, I we're getting <laughs> close to it and I, I'm skating that fine line because I, we'll just move on. All right. Steve says uh, he's planning on coming to the event. Looking forward to it. Steve, I'm looking forward to meeting you. All right. Rick says, what's up? Not much, Rick. And he says, awesome channel. Thank you. Love this show. Thank you. He's from Virginia. Nice. Welcome, Rick. Appreciate you tuning in. Cody Sarver wants to know, do you guys typically use cedar or pine two by four runners on a cedar fence and why? Well, I know you don't use pine at all. Right. Right? Right. Yeah. So, so we well, use pine for our cedar fence and pine posts. Yeah. So right now we're not using pine. Um, well, quality is an issue. But two, uh, price hasn't come back down to reality. So I don't want I don't want this to sound like I will never ever use pine and ever again in the future. We probably will. I mean, once yeah. price comes down to reality and supply chain isn't an issue. So when we're doing that, we offer three different types of fence. We'll offer a treated pine picket, treated pine rail on treated pine posts. So a completely treated pine system. Then the second option is to upgrade the pickets to cedar. So you got cedar pickets, treated pine rails, treated pine posts. And then the third, the one I prefer to install, cedar picket, cedar rails, steel post. Steel post. Yeah. And that's and, and you could pre-stain any of the cedar materials for an even better look. Uh, I, cedar is less less prone to warping and twisting. It's sure. just, it, it's a better quality material than treated pine. Um, yeah. Why would we use treated pine? For a more budget conscious consumer. Yep. You know, I, I don't know a great way of saying that. Um, it's when, when we present these, we present them as value, which is all the treated pine improved value, which is cedar pickets on treated pine. And then the lifetime value, which is cedar pickets, yeah. cedar rails, steel post. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I think, I think because one of the, because null treated pine fence is exactly that it's, it's the value option um, because not every house needs a cedar fence and cedar. I mean, if someone's getting ready to sell their house and just really needs a fence around it, Maybe they're not interested in cedar 
all seater with seal post. Yep. I would argue that they would probably bring more for the house with a quality fence because it would give a great impression from the road. But I'm a fence guy and I sell fence, so I'm a little biased on that. All right. Brandon Markham says, I'm writing my training protocol. I'd love as much help as I can get. Well, Brandon, I'd say if you've got time, come hang out with us in Nashville. Yep, we'll have plenty there. I mean, so Sean also does a great job of, of putting training content out into the world on the fencing Facebook groups. Uh, you can see him around there. Um, but I would recommend and highly encourage you to come out and see him. The the stain and seal and the fencing, both of the events, it's a two-day event. Both are completely free. Yep. So you just got to get yourself there, and then uh, the rest of it's on the house. Thumbs up to you, Rick. Appreciate you coming in. Sammy Valenzuela. Man, I hope I didn't just really butcher that for you, Sammy. This question might have already been asked. Just new here. Why is your company better than the others? I'll take this one because I that actually rubs me the wrong way. Uh, I The conversation should never be why I'm better than somebody else. The conversation should probably go to why I'm different than somebody else because – the better statement is a perspective from somebody else's view. So this customer might think I'm better because of this reason, but that customer may not think I'm better. So I think it's, uh, I think when you get away from saying the number one fence company, the best fence company, I'm the, it's, this is who I am. And these are my clients that love me. And these clients love this fence company. Yep. Yep. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, we bring a certain level of value to the, to a fencing project. Um, doesn't mean we're any better or any worse than someone else. They're just going to have a different level of value that they bring. So yeah. that's where I would, that's where I would go, Sammy. Well, guys, it is a little is one minute after five 30. We'd like to end this right around five 30. If you got any last minute, last minute questions or comments, drop them in the comments below. Uh, yeah. If not, then, uh, Sean and I will see you guys hopefully here in a few weeks. In February at Nashville or it, Lebanon. Yeah, Lebanon. So just outside. Lebanon, Man, Lebanon, something like that. Yeah. So here in Missouri, we've got Lebanon. Um, I've heard it Lebanon too. I, I could understand that too. I'm not sure. Actually, I don't know which way it goes, to be honest. I just call it Lebanon because we've got one here. We'll ask somebody. But I That's appreciate like, you being here. Thank you very much. Yep, uh, absolutely. And guys, if you're if you're watching the replay and you've got a question, drop it in the comments below because we'll we'll keep we'll keep watching the comments and then a, we'll either answer it as it comes up, and then B, we'll probably talk about it the next time we get together on an Ask the Expert live with Sean. Hey, what are we going to do Thursday on Ask the Expert in Lebanon? That is, a, that is an excellent question, and that's what I'm currently trying to figure out. So the, the chances that I can pick this studio up and move it to Lebanon are probably slim to none. I mean, we've got like, lights and camera and we got a bunch of audio stuff um well yeah. but my my camera team will be there and we'll have all of our gear okay 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 maybe he's doing a rustic outdoor site with multiple people on the channel i like it i like this that is- a lot <laughs> i like that a lot actually yeah we'll see what happens. we will we'll see about putting this together um yeah, because it's usually three to five thirty. So actually, I tell you what. So where my mind goes is, I wonder. So I know. Well, I know the indoor place that was used uh, for the last training, and it would probably we could probably put together a panel yep. where me, you, Sean, whomever, uh, uh, we we yeah. do just a big group. Ask the expert. Maybe. Maybe that sounds kind of interesting. So okay. something else for us to put in our brains and try to figure out. We can have a live audience then too. Yeah, that's the thing. And so that's where my mind goes with that is, you know, we could have, it would be a live Q&A with you guys on YouTube, but also anyone attending. Um, I think I think it would be good for, you know, the quality and quantity of questions. We get, we certainly get more questions, I would think. We'll work it out. All so, right, yeah, we're going to have to put that together. Well, guys, right. appreciate you guys tuning in, sticking with us. Sean, thank you for your time. I, anytime I ask you to come on, you're more than willing to. And every, anytime I need to pick up the phone, you always answer. So I appreciate that a whole lot. Thank you, sir. Guys, have a great day. For now, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, reminding you 
The good fences make good neighbors. See you guys. See ya.